There we have it. We're live. Welcome to the fourth um, edition of the live um, animal rights show. And for this week, we have a subject that's very close to both of our hearts. <laughs> Je Jer Jeremy, Jeremy, I've been, I've been clapping since Thursday. Am I allowed to stop now? <laughs> Yes, we've done enough job of pumping this thing up. <laughs> You're excited about this topic too, I can see. That's great. <laughs> but yeah, I think for both of us, language is a topic that's um, close to our hearts. I think for me, it's something I know in my own personal advocacy, and I think at a bigger movement level, it's probably the most powerful way we can really evolve our advocacy. And also, sadly, I think it's one of the most overlooked. So that's really the purpose of this session is to look at things from a rights-based perspective, obviously the, the spirit behind the show, um, a non-species perspective, and then also a strategic at a strategic level, we're blessed to have a sociologist with us here, over here, you're this side. <laughs> so, I mean, just in really interpreting not just what we say, but how it might be interpreted by the audience. And this is obviously a tricky thing that comes down a lot to context. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of different things we can cover when it comes to language. Um, I think, um, you know, focusing on the objective nature and making sure we're not derailing the conversation. And um, as uh, Reagan might say, digging the hole deeper. Um, while at the same time, not this, this isn't about being politically correct or apologetic or any of that stuff. It's still being direct and firm on our message, but just doing it in a mindful way. So... Mm. With that, do you want to imbue us with any wisdom of your thoughts around language, Roger? Well, I noticed you got Reagan in um, within the first minute, so I'll, the check's in the post <laughs> on that one. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, I, to be honest, I think this is probably going to be your show, Rick, because I don't give a shit about language. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give me a heads up and I'll beep, I'll, I'll use my little sound effects yeah, to beep, beep those. <laughs> I don't give a beep about language. So, um, let, let, let the audience see your screen. Uh, what was it called? A, What's it called? A, a green screen. Oh, are we talking behind here? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. in the spirit of the topic, I thought yeah. I would do a backdrop blah, blah, that blah, says blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. blah, blah. So, blah, hopefully, blah. <laughs> we can find ways to communicate with others so it doesn't yeah. sound like we're saying blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, maybe, maybe me can just do that, you know? <laughs> now, what yeah. we're looking at now. Um, Jeremy, this is this is from uh, the Vegan Interactions website, right? So do you want to go through this? Is, this is a really great document, folks. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I linked it in the um, the text, the main text caption of this video, and the whole idea is to help this be a framework. But to be honest, we'd much rather um, get interaction from everyone who joins us, be it either typing a comment. And a new thing we're trying today is to join us live by a via, uh, video chat. So if you are interested in trying that, if you drop an X in the comments and I'll post the link to join us and we'll see if we can give that a go. The internet seems strong at the moment. So I, th I, I fingers crossed we can actually pull this off and you know let as many voices be heard as possible. Um, as far as this document, we're looking straight at the table of contents and it's about a 20 page document. So we're not gonna go through it all in depth today, but these are um, the sections. Oh, I thought you were gonna read it out, Jeremy. No? <laughs> That, that would probably be the quickest way to lose people I can think of. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, let's just check out the comments, because I think we've, we've been going for a bit. So I think we've got just a few. So it looks like Allison is interested in joining us via, via video chat. So if I can just get that link, and I'll just post it in the main chat here. And you will be able to join us, Al. So keep an eye out for that link. And we are in about a 10 to 15 second delay. And anyone joining us, it is best if you turn the audio off of your um, Facebook feed when you join us. Otherwise, you'll get a very interesting lag situation going on. Um, but once you join that and she's in the stream, I can pull her in and we can, we can um, go about it that way. But I think just quickly to go through some of the key sections, I think, when it comes to uh, the language of animal rights is sim quite simply how we're gonna refer to other animals. There's a bit of a key in the um, uh, title of that, of how I tend to do it, the um, reference to other animals. Um, and al then also um, how we're gonna refer to our um, audience or those, um, you know, the vegan curious or non-vegans. And then, and then it gets more into kind of describing the process of animal use and some specifics around that, as well as kind of big picture observations um, but yeah, I think as Allison joins us, we might as well just 
I think it's just starting into the, 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 the heart of this document, which to me is how we refer to other animals. Um, I think Roger and I both have probably quite similar um, views, however not, um, yeah, I'd say we probably align on most of this when it comes to referring to other animals. Did you say that's fair, Roger? Or should I state my should I state my case first, and then you can decide before you agree to anything? No, no, no. We 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 we, <laughs> we, we agree. I, I, we have not known to disagree on any anything, Jeremy. But um, uh, it's interesting because obviously the, the the debate between the phrase uh, other animals and non-human animals, isn't it? That's that's one one phrase. Um, mm. In relation to what's on the screen now, I regularly on Facebook, I just put a very polite uh, thing in the comments saying, you know, please, please don't refer to other animals it. Mm. And um, it's interesting about the reaction to that, because a lot of people kind of go back and say, oh, yeah, sorry about that. You know, it was a mistake or, or whatever. But other, other people um, do the old kind of, well, it's grammatically correct, you know. So, you know, the, the, issue, the issue about language is that um, linguistics is very important within a social movement, you know. So a lot of what a social movement do is linguistic in nature. And the example I always give about that is that uh, if you think about the feminist movement, they changed the notion of history into his story to emphasize who usually gets to write the history of anything, you know? Mm. So language is very important within the social movement. That's, what, that's why it's a big issue uh, for us, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, we, we could, <laughs> we're about to um, talk about language for, you know, an hour or more. And I think- Well, you um, are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you have something to say. <laughs> this is the Jeremy and Roger show, not just the Jeremy show. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the animal rights, because obviously they come, you know, they're, they're animal-centric framing here, people. So, um, but yeah, I think if we could just align on this first first thing, I think to me, I would quite happily, you know, call it a day almost. You know, obviously move on to those other topics eventually. But to me, the focus is just, you know, not referring to other animals as it, because I don't think there's much more we could do to be you know, disempowering and, and, and the rest of it. Because, you know, if we're going to build the case that they are unique individuals with a valid claim to basic moral rights, I think it's going to be difficult to do that if we're referring to them with the same words that we use to refer to a block of wood, for instance. A lot of people find it clunky to go the he, she thing, don't they? That's one of the things uh, that people, people don't like. And uh, usually the objection to this uh, idea is that, well, we call babies it which is true, we do call human babies it, you know. But, but the, the point from my point of view is that we're doing this as a political act. Mm. The, the idea is to alter the, to the language. You know, one of the people who tried to do that um, very, very much is someone called Jane, uh, Joan Denea, and she had her, her own kind of thesaurus, and she wanted um, people to start using a different type of language in order to kind of... Um, take people out of their comfort zone a little bit, but also to educate them in, in a kind of different way. My favorite of all the Joan Denea things is she used to call uh, fish tanks and um, aquariums aqua prisons, mm. which, are, you know, I, I, I always liked that one. But, you know, she's, she's got, in fact, I've, I've got the uh, copy of, of it all here, but there's, um, there's a whole chapter in a book called Animal Equality, Language and Liberation. And there's a whole chapter where she talks about how we could use language as a kind of political tool. And that's what you're doing, really, isn't it, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah, because I think, uh, I, I just as I, as I mentioned at the opening, I really do think this is the biggest thing that we can do to, to um, communicate our message. Um, and I think the as far as the she, he part, to me, I take it to being, um, if I know their gender, I'll say their gender. However, if I don't, I'll default to they or them. Um, I have heard um, some people that say she by default to help, you know, a little subtle nod to dismantling the patriarchy in there. So th <clears> that's <throat> one option. Um, that's an, that's an academic thing. You know, ac academics have done that since, say, the mid 80s. They've, they've often put she almost automatically to kind of counterbalance the fact that right up until then, everyone for humanity has said, you know, he, you know, mm. and man, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think um, we've had a few chats about this, and the um, in the past, you know, we've done, I did a language video a couple of years ago that I've been meaning to update, and we did a podcast, what, it's probably been a year or more or so now, on your 
channel um, uh, on, on human, non-human relations. And that was, yeah, close to two hours and a lot of that was around language. And I think I've actually evolved a lot of what I would say now, which I think is the key here is to not be fixed and to be really fluid and dynamic with the um, words we choose to use and not be too set in one particular direction. Mm, well, being, fli being fixed is actually very important. Um, academics call that reflexivity, but the idea is that um, veganism is supposed to engender critical thinking. You know, we're so we know veganism is a revolutionary radical idea, and so we're supposed to kind of train ourselves to become critical thinkers because vegans think differently than the general population. You know, an animal rights mindset um, leads to a different way of thinking, and then that leads to a different way of talking. That's that's what mm. that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Well, I think we have our first ever live guest of the Animal Rights Show queued up in our studio audience. So with that, if we could all welcome, <laughs> if I can figure out this, how this doohickey works. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Oh, there we go. That's better. <laughs> We're getting hey. this figured out. Oh, that's even better. Look at that. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah. I mean, would it have killed me to look in a mirror before I agreed to do this? <laughs> this is going to be on the internet forever. <laughs> Whew. I mean, I just want to say though that this I'm an international guest joining. I'm in Indiana. We're in the middle of the of the, of um, the United States here and it's 8 a.m. So I'd like to just have that context be out there and just I just started the coffee. <laughs> just putting the is, disclaimer out there. Fair enough. <laughs> is that is that Allison, is that code for I'm still asleep? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Okay, right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're based out in uh, Indiana. How, how have things been going? I am. Oh, things are fine. I mean, we have some issues in our country generally right now. I don't know if you know anything about that. Um, <laughs> I won't even dip my toe into that conversation. But, um, it, it, it wouldn't be anything to do with a president. Oh. It? I mean, you know. We're talking about language, not politics. Come on, uh, come on. Know, that's my most charitable um, classification. But yeah, I mean, there are some, you know, there are some things happening with the coronavirus, everything. It's been a very unique time. But for the most part, I think we're doing okay. I have a couple of people in my life who work at the hospital here, and it's been a challenging and unique time. But I think a time that's also, I'm really trying to look at the positive. Um, and there is an opportunity with all of this to really think about things and slow down. And, you know, when things go back to normal, whatever that means, what do you want to bring back into your life and what is most important to you? And so, yeah. Actually, that's one of the one of the most frightening things about the discourse that's going on, uh, Alison, at the moment is that people are kind of yearning to go back to normal, but we can't. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like uh, the VIP Vegan Information Project, we, we've got one of our posters which says um, normal, normal is violent. And right. the thing is, we don't mm -hmm. want to go back to normal. I mean, we, we need to shake things up. And, and the, envir the environment can't um, take us going back to, to normal. You know, people are, are kind of going, oh, I'm a wedding planner and I can't wait to get back into the air again. And all the, the airlines come mm -hmm. back on stream. People are going, oh, I want to go to Bermuda and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're the same people that are posting pictures on Facebook saying, "Oh, look at look how clean the air is, and look look at the, you know the fishes are coming back to the sea, you know all that kind of stuff, you know." Right. Apart, you know, bit of a disconnect there. Yeah, you can't have it both ways, can you? Yeah. Well, apparently, the biggest thing, or the, the kind of most interesting thing that I've seen uh, for the last few days, is apparently whales are benefiting greatly because the ocean is quiet now. Yeah. And of course, they communicate over many miles, right? Right. And and normally they're drowned out by all these um, what they call propellers and rotor blades and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm, it's good. It's good for the whales, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Yeah. And um, I, I I understand. So just full disclosure, this is my sister Allison. So we do have a a bit yeah. of a, a genetic relation there. So. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of one. Yeah. yeah just a small, tiny one. <laughs> I don't know, around fifty percent or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I understand. You help support a sanctuary out there. So, how how have things been going for them? 
I do, yeah. Um, I'm a part of Uplands Peak Sanctuary. We are located in a perfectly named town here in Indiana, the town of Freedom, Indiana. We, um, we started in 2013, but we just moved to this new property in 2018. So we're still sort of getting settled on these 105 acres that we now have for the sanctuary. And yeah, it was, I mean, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. You know, you make all these plans for the year and you have all these ideas and then there's a worldwide pandemic. And so we have really had to adjust and I mean, again, it, it started off pretty difficult, but in the process of adjusting, we found a lot of good things. We've actually um, really enjoyed kind of expanding our community outreach and our community service. And we've started doing uh, virtual tours, we call them virtual videos each week. So via Facebook, folks can um, join the live stream and check in with the residents and ask questions. And it's been really nice. It's been a good way to connect. I haven't actually been out to the property even for, I don't know, it seems like two years, but it's been probably six weeks now. And so for all of us who are used to being on site and volunteering and being a part of things, it's been really nice. And I think we've reached a lot of people with that kind of positivity and the connection and the, you know, you're not alone. There's a lot of good things happening, hang in there kind of message. Yeah, yeah. Was, and, and I, finding ways to support them kind of virtually. Yeah. Can, can I can I just ask a question directly on on that? Um, of course. You said about the virtual tour. Uh, has any of that been filmed? Because I'd like to see what that looks like. You know, because I imagine there's a there's a few sanctuaries that could do that as well. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I will, um, Roger. I'll make sure you have the link to our Facebook page, Uplands Peak Sanctuary. They're all on there, and that's a great thing about it too. If you're not able to join live like this show, you can always look in the archive later and watch. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And it's oh, okay. too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an educational opportunity too, right? We typically in May would be doing um, educational tours on the weekends, and that's not possible right now. So instead, we're doing these tours. And Michelle, who's one of our co-founders, she does um, an exquisite job of talking about the resident stories and answering questions. And last night, we checked in with the goat herd. And so, you know, people were shocked to hear about, you know, people in the States eating goats. But then we, you know, had to talk about dairy because goats die for dairy. Um, mm. So all of this kind of stuff. So it's a really feel good thing, but there's also an educational component, which has been really nice. Mm, that, yeah, that I, education. I, so, sorry, Jeremy, you carry on. I was just going to say, because I, I believe one, um, bringing it back to the, the topic of language, it sounds, I think <laughs> one cool thing out there is that they refer to all their residents as people. Mm -hmm. So I think that's yeah. quite a, 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 a good way to highlight that they are unique individuals. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, when Sandra Higgins, Sandra Higgins went on a TV show in Ireland and um, she talked about the residents and the mm -hmm. presenter kept butting in and said, you talk about the animals now, aren't you? You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's, and that's, that's quite yeah. a good way to um, do that um, culture shock, isn't it? To kind of make them point out that, yes, I am using this language and this is why. Right. So it could work right. in our favor in yeah. a lot of ways. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it takes, um, it really takes people kind of pausing and thinking through things because a lot of these things we've said for so many years, like referring to these individuals as it. Um, I mean, most people don't do that because they think it's true. It's just almost a knee jerk thing. So it is important to have a kind of kind way to say to people, oh, you know, there might be a better way to refer to to these individuals. I mean, so on the topic of language, um, I guess I'm trying to figure out um, you know, when we're talking about other animals, what's the best way to refer to them that's not othering and diminishing? So I don't know, I sort of find non-human animal to be to be that. I don't really like that term anymore. So I've started saying individuals quite a bit more, but I wondered what your take on that might be. It's a tricky one. I think from my understanding, um, and I, I know Roger will have some thoughts of his own. Um, no. I have a, yeah, <laughs> not right. a single thought. <laughs> See what I do to try to carry this thing. <laughs> um, but I've, I've, you know, done the uh, mental gymnastics around this and um, a lot, and I keep coming back to other animals. And while it does have other, you know, in the the, the mm -hmm. verbiage, it's I think it's hard to find an alternative that still ticks the boxes in a way. Mm -hmm. I personally find non-human animal, while I used it for more than a year, to be a bit robotic. And from an interpretation perspective, which I know is Roger's specialty, I started to get more concerned that people would understand what I meant by that and not get, you know, hung up a bit on that word versus mm -hmm. actually listening to the overall message. 
-hmm. So that's where I think keeping things simple and direct. Um, mm. The book I'm reading, um, Fellow Creatures, um, by uh, uh, Christine <laughs> Korsgaard. I'm, Ro Roger's been waiting on his copy for a couple of weeks. Still, so I think that's why it's still not arrived now. <laughs> good old oh, Irish no. Post. <laughs> But the thing that this book got, got me thinking about is um, thinking of saying our fellow animals as an alternative to other mm -hmm. animals. Mm -hmm. So that really, you know, is a way to highlight the similarities, which mm -hmm. I've moved more and more towards highlighting the similarities between other animals and humans. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think just any, any way we can highlight their individuality, which in fairness should stand on its own. We shouldn't have to compare them to us um, to mm -hmm. give them value. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I do think that is helpful in s certain circumstances. How about you, Roger? Well, Did I say if, everything you want to if, say. That if, I steal if, you're gonna, if you're going to start waving books around, Jeremy, this is um... <laughs> well, a <we'll> book off. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you, I can play this game. <laughs> yeah, you. Well, you, you can book off if you want. I'll uh, I'll stay. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, th so this is uh, Piers Byrne, uh, who is a um, criminologist and. Um, in terms of language, very interested in language, but a colleague of uh, appears, um, and uh, excuse me if I get this wrong, uh, Gertrude, but we're talking about Gertrude Kazakhs. And she came up with um, an interesting one, which was animals other than human animals. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, obviously, that's um, quite a kind of mouthful in a way, but um, do, you think, do you think that would um, that would do it in the sense that it, purposely designed to point out the fact that we are animals too. What do you think? Yeah, I like that a lot. And I do, I, I do think sort of even just the simpler version, the other animals is highlighting the fact that we humans are animals too, which does seem really important. So I like, I like both of those, maybe the mouthful version in writing or in certain circumstances and then other mm. animals, um, you know, what well, I mean, it, it is true that uh, humans are often in denial. I mean, they often will object to the fact that, well, I'm, I'm not an animal, you know. That right. I don't, yeah. right. Well, and, sometimes, and the question is, yeah. do we work within that or try to dismantle that, which is probably a constant thing as animal advocates we have to do on multiple topics. Yeah. We, we smash it down. <laughs> we know what Roger wants to do. He wants to smash it. <laughs> smash it. <laughs> smash the speciesism. Smash right. the human superiority. <laughs> humans are interesting though aren't we because we want to own certain things like we want to own the fact oh i'm a i'm a carnivore look at my canine yeah. teeth but then we don't want to be animals so i mean make a choice go with one or the other <laughs> you know? that's a good point and some points around um it i think there's some interesting comments here um specifically around um the point around babies being referred to as it and that that seems equally odd is what mm. um, uh, Brad's pointing out here, which I would tend to kind of agree with. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I think if someone used that as a defense, it's like, well, should we actually be calling human babies it? I think that's well, an I, interesting I, question. I've, I've, I've seen that regularly. People say, well, you know, that's just <clears throat> the grammatically correct thing to do. We call mm. other, other animals it, and we, uh, as we call human babies it. I mean, I would mm. go back to um, a famous ethno-methodology thing, which said, um, you know, the baby cried, the mother picked it up. Mm. And yeah, and so there's a it's in there st st straight away. But um, I, I thought it was fairly common to call uh, human babies it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think um, another point around that is if we're not sure the gender, just to say they, that mm -hmm. sounds like Tom kind of uses a similar approach, they, them, as, as I do. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think the thing to me around all this is is really you know, almost trying to move away from what, what to call other animals, as it were, and to actually just refer to them as individuals. I'm looking forward to the day mm -hmm. where I start having conversations with people about, you know, my furry um, canine friends at home here, and they say, oh, wait, are we talking about a dog? And I say, <laughs> oh, yeah, of course we are. You know, and it's, it's, you know, all of a sudden, their, their species isn't the central point. It's they're an individual who happens mm -hmm. to be this species versus right. this is their species. Oh, yeah, and they're an individual, you know, kind of flipping right. it. I will tell you one thing interesting about that is uh, I don't know if you know Patrice Jones from the Vine um, yeah. Vegans. Yeah. Uh, well, they um, they tell the story ab about how they try to separate um, ducks from 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 one another. I think, and it, it ended up that they worked out in the end that um, some of the ducks were gay, and that's mm -hmm. why they were they they were kind of. Um, always found congregating together rather than being in a kind of mixed mixed kind of biological sex group kind of thing. Yeah. But I mean, it, it kind of, um, 
opens up the issue about you know I wonder if there's any trans other animals you know that's an interesting yeah too, you know. mm. yeah definitely yeah to, to say to say there aren't would be probably simultaneously speciesist and transphobic wouldn't mm, it yeah, yeah. um Mika makes an interesting point around context. I think around all this stuff, there's no dead set rules. I think, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have certainly a lot of opinions on what to do in certain contexts. However, there's no hard and fast rules. I think we have to think on our feet a little bit and have a bit of a baseline. And then depending on the audience, if we're talking to someone who's actually been vegan curious for years, we can probably be a little bit more um, experimental with our language. Yeah, but that's not, that's, that's not saying depending on the context, whether you say it or not, though, is it? Correct. This is moving on to a separate, just kind of a more general point around language, I think. And with that, I think we have, it looks like we have around 22 people with us. Please start checking your um, questions or thoughts in the comments. I would say if it is a question, if you can lead it off with a Q and a colon, that'll help us to find it quicker. And if you want to join us by video chat, we'll see how many people we can get on this thing. So <laughs> <laughs> with yeah, that, feel free, let's, let's feel have free a party. to... <laughs> if you do want a coffee real f refill, feel free to um, head off at any point, Al. You're not you're not okay. stuck for the whole two hours or however long this thing goes for. <laughs> he knows me well. He's known me a long time. <laughs> can can, I, can I do that as well? Can I do that as well? <laughs> no, Roger, you're stuck here. Yeah, your name is no show. I don't know, Roger. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Alison, you said that you're in freedom. So is there currently a lockdown in freedom? Yeah, the state of Indiana is still, um, we're on the kind of stay at home order for a little while longer. Yeah, things are slowly starting to open, which uh, people have kind of mixed reviews on. We have a, we're a pretty conservative state overall. But yeah, you don't say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, however, I live in kind of a blue oasis in a red state. I'm in a college town, which is a nice insulation. So, um, yeah, so things are slowly starting to reopen, which will be interesting. We'll see. Mm. No, it's just very ironic, though, isn't it, that you're in freedom and there's a lockdown, so. It is. <laughs> that, that was Roger's humor, Al. So. Oh, oh, got it. <laughs> yeah. I've just been introduced to it. It's about with a U. <laughs> 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 well, we have a, this is a, a follow on from our last week. We had uh, one of our questions was any recommended compact, uh, uh, podcasts and the Let's Rage particular podcast. It sounds like Ian's been listening to and really uh, thankful for that recommendation. So I think that's one where uh, uh, the three of us might, might already be familiar with. But that is really a good mm -hmm. source for kind of out of the box thinking on some of these subjects and really critically breaking down these subjects. Hmm. Oh. And uh, every now and again, they mentions um, a sociologist uh, every now and again. So it's a pretty good podcast. And we, had, and we had along the lines of resources, and that's the whole spirit behind continuing to learn and evolve because we're all still learning. As far as the book titles, we've got a request to, to have a screen off with our books. So we'll... Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. So with that, let's um, see if we can do this. All right. So if you've got yours, so yours is Confronting Animal Abuse. And who's the author on that, Roger? Piers Byrne. All right, and I'm looking at Fellow Creatures, and this is a fairly new book. It's only um, as of 2018, and that is by Christine Korsgaard, which you might not be yeah, here at the top here. You can see the author's name. So mm -hmm. I, I've only um, just started reading this book, um, and it's really, I've been yearning to have a, a rights-based um, animal rights book written by a high-level philosopher ever since I finished reading The Case for Animal Rights by Tom Reagan, the originator of rights-based animal rights and the inspiration behind the show. So I really <laughs> am looking forward to, to packing this down. I just thought I'd get one more, one more plug in there for you, Roger. Yeah, you mentioned Reagan again. This, um, <laughs> the, 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 book, the book by uh, Piers Byrne. Um, Piers Byrne is a criminologist. And um, <clears throat> one of the first um, journal articles I ever wrote was with Piers and um, my PhD supervisor called Chris Powell. And um, he kindly kind of reproduced it in, in the book, uh, which is nice and updated it. But there's a, an interesting kind of language thing there because um, this is about uh, people who attack uh, horses in fields. And um, there's a kind of ri ritualistic thing that goes on and it, um, it happens all over the world, but mainly in mainland Europe, but it happened in, in Britain I think about 1993, and that's that's the the one we looked at, and um, it's generally called horse maiming, but the tabloids changed that to horse ripping, you know, because it, it, to make it more sensational. So you know, again, you know, we we can't get away from the fact that 
language is with us all the time and it's it's political always is you know yeah i agree i agree mm. and I, I yeah um i think with that with should we um pop back to the the document itself because i think there's some things around there and i think so it sounds like, back to the point of non-human animals. Is that something you use yourself, Roger? It sounds like you kind of still use it, but it, uh, uh, maybe the focus is other animals, but you, uh, non-human animals is still within the scope of the language you use. Mm, yeah, well, I suppose I got I got into the use of it in the sense that um, I, uh, you know, a PhD is is uh, about uh, on human non-human relations, so um, so that became a bit of a standard thing. For me, but I did I did change that to other animals in terms of, of the way I, I speak, you know, in the same way as we've um, altered our language about, uh, you know, so-called pets uh, and that, we, you know, these things evolve. Uh, as you say, you um, you find that things are not fixed. So you, you kind of think you've corrected something and then you actually start looking at the correction then and thinking, well, perhaps that's not great either, you know. But um, mm. but then again, you know, if you say non-human animal uh, on the street, you could cause confusion just as much as saying other animal. So um, the common common to that um, it's about the context is very true. Obviously, we 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 are social animals, and we have to um, adapt to the context at any given moment. Yeah, and I think to that point, Wendy's got a question about what we think about the term non-human person or people as a term. Hmm. Well. Uh, it's um it's interesting that one because um person and people get confused in people's mind and so when you talk about for example Gary Francione's got a book called um animals as persons and basically what he's talking about there is moral persons and then the idea of becoming legal persons in the same way as a, a corporation could be a legal person and so although other animals are classified as things in law you've got corporations classified as persons in law, so yeah, that that might be an interesting one, because it, it would kind of like move the um, the converse, conversation on, at the risk, as always with these things, of of kind of confusing people, and you might need to clarify all the time. Perhaps I don't know. Yeah, and I think one one distinction I uh, did a Q and A um, a few weeks back, obviously because of the lockdown, and I didn't even realize I was doing this until my a fellow advocate pointed out that I was refer I was careful to refer to humans versus um, generically people because I think unless we're specifically referring to other animals, it could be confused that we're suggesting humans are people and other animals are not. So I think that's another one of those context things that um, to be careful to not just almost uh, increase the divide and say you know oh we're we're people and other animals are not. So I think that's a, a, an interesting way to try to dismantle that. Mm. Um, and I, I'd say with all this stuff, just try it out. And the theory I like to work with is, especially around fellow animal advocates, to um, try new words a bit more. And then if we're advocating and speaking to the vegan curious, maybe be a little bit more um, objective and direct and not as experimental with our language. See, that's an interesting political thing. Vegan curious rather than corp corpse muncher or something. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so you're saying you don't want to endorse Corpse Muncher? <laughs> well, funny, funny enough, cor Corpse Muncher became very kind of popular around about um, 2011, and a lot of people were using Corpse mun Muncher, you know. And then people thought, well, it's not not great because it's obviously interpreted as a, as a slur, in the same way as Carnism is now being kind of like seen as a, a bit of a slur, you know. Oh, you're a Carnist, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think we've got another question coming up here from Ruby, which is if these books are available in electronic format um, and they're cheaper. So I, I think the short answer is generally yes. You probably have more of a knowledge for some of those specific instances. I, I know that Fellow Creatures, I believe, is available on um, Amazon for, I want to say it's 12 or 13 pounds compared to maybe 16 if you buy it. So it is a little bit cheaper. Um, however, that is different, and please confirm those numbers. That's off the top of my head. I think for some of the older texts that I think um, uh, you have in your library, Roger, it might be harder to find those electronically. I, is I would, that fair? Yeah, I would say so. Although this is um, this is pretty kind of modern, or at least it is for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just trying to think, uh, see if I can find the date. I mean, this is going to be, you know, it's not going to be the nineteen nineties uh, for a start. So, uh, oh, this is two thousand and nine. But whether there's a kind of 
Are, are we talking kind of Kindle type thing? Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, I guess the main ways would be over yeah Amazon, um, the Amazon eBooks to download on say Kindle. Um, Amazon is a dodgy company. <laughs> so there we, we are back to the politics we, the we politics. try to talk about language and it keeps coming back to the politics <laughs> wow you can't get away from it <laughs> if well, you thought I'll, you, if I'll, you I thought think... you could have a day off Jer uh, <laughs> jeremy you're wrong <laughs> these topics are entangled aren't they yeah, and i think uh, allison i think went for a coffee run however she's um pointed out that a great great book is the oxen at the intersection by patrice jones are you familiar mm. with that one roger Yes, yes, and um, also after aftershock by Patrice as well. And it's interesting that um, Alison uses um, lowercase for Patrice's um, full name, which which is good. So you you wouldn't use the capital P or J. And um, a lot a lot of a lot of fem that's a kind of feminist thing. It's kind of second wave feminist. A, a, a lot of feminists started to write their name. You know, there's bell hooks, for example, and there's there's quite quite a few who um, who wouldn't use. Um, you know, capital letters. I'm not actually quite sure why. So that'd be interesting if anybody out there knows exactly why, because I'm, I think I kind of vaguely know why, but what, why, why is that everybody? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> I thought you were going to come over out. To you. I, I, was, I was on the edge of my seat waiting for an elaborate explanation. No, no, coming over, from you. Over, over to you. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> over to you. Is that, is that how this works? Oh, my connection. I'm losing my connection. I think I'm dropping out. <laughs> uh, um, I, and I think uh, this has, it looks like Fellow Creatures is on um, Kindle for ten pounds. So thank you, Jessica, for for confirming that. So I think that is, right. and from an environmental perspective, I think it's probably worth noting that there is a case to be made if it's um, easy enough on the eyes to read from a device. That probably is better than the process of printing a book. The case could be made hmm. and save a few bucks too. We're getting lots of comments. Thank you. Thanks so much for all the comments, folks. It's really good. Yeah, and I think we've got some people that may want to join us live. So what I'll do is I'll post the link in the comments. And when you're ready, you can go ahead and join us. And I'll, I'll pull okay. you into the, 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 ch the chat. So if you click this link, and then we'll be, we'll be ready to go. So um, it looks like Tim might join us live here in the studio here in a few minutes. And here's a question from Brad in the meantime. <laughs> that's, not, that's not birthday boy Bar Barford, is it? Ah, just, just, just passed, isn't it? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so Brad has a question: Are non-human animals people slash persons? A quick Ecosia search for the definition of the word shows that a person is exclusively a human being. So I think that's quite interesting. I mean, how, no, it's how not, much? Not, not in law, though. You see, not in law. That's that's not true in law. So you can get a legal person. As I said, a corporation could be a legal person in law. So if you look up a legal definition, you'll get a different thing. Yeah, and I think that's the key is, you know, if, if we restrict ourselves to the, what we find in a, a dictionary or a Google search or even a Ecosa search, um, I think we're going to really restrict ourselves and, and restrict that ability for our language to be dynamic and to explore these new things. Yeah, well, Brad, I, I mean, Brad, the... Brad is just pushing my buttons here because um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the things, you know, like uh, it infuriates me when people use the uh, vegan definition, especially dictionary ones, because... A definition, dictionary definitions of most things don't really cut it, really. And, but even some of the technical ones don't, you know. And um, one, one thing that I always point out is that a lot of online de um, definitions now have got hyperlinks inside them, pointing out the fact that, you know, these things, the more you look into, the more complex they become. But, um, yeah, I would say if you go to a legal definition, it would be different, I would think. Well, and as, as you often point out, as a, um, <laughs> as a movement, we're, you know, we're claims makers. We're, we're trying to dismantle well. the current set of beliefs. And when we take into consideration, these dictionaries were written from a speciesist, um, human-centric perspective. And that's what we're trying to dismantle and, and, and yep. try to make it more of an all-animal-centric That's a very um, good point. That's a very good point. Every once in a while, I make one. Hmm. <laughs> well, I think we have our next guest ready to join us. I believe... Uh, Tim may be able to, to join us if I can, if I can figure out this uh, technology here, and I think he might have a question for us. If I can figure yeah. out the technology. Hello. Right. <laughs> here we are. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing, Tim? Jeremy, lovely to see you, Roger. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone watching. Fantastic. Well done, guys. This is what? awesome. Yeah, welcome, Tim. Uh, for those who may not already know, is the manager of VegFest UK, so puts on some great events here in the UK to help build vegan awareness and also connect fellow advocates, which is really kind of the spirit behind this show as well. 
Indeed, on that note, we've just launched our new show. Thanks for the cue, Jeremy. We've got a global <laughs> online veg fest happening in August, just announced yesterday. So um, people from all over the world will be able to join in. It'll be running over three days in August. Uh, hopefully, you, you'll be both joining us for part of that too. That'd be great. great. Um, Roger's so, nodding his head. Right. Good show. <laughs> I think it's really good we're discussing animal rights. Um, I've got a little question for Roger particularly, but it's more a discussion actually, Roger. But um, I know that uh, I pay attention to quite a lot of your comments <laughs> on Facebook. And, uh, I know that you're quite a, quite critical um, in, a, in a supportive fashion, I should say, but you're, you're quite critical of the use of language by some activists, in particular in relation to treatment when you perhaps feel they should be focusing more on the use and that the language can get a little bit more about sort of talking about cruelty talking about conditions about welfare instead of focusing on the fact that you know animals should not be used at all in the first place is that is that a fair sort of comment is that your position pretty much on that Oh, yeah, I think he's pretending his mic's not working. <laughs> oh, I, I believe his mic actually is not working. Right. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, there it is. I had, uh, I had, uh... You can only use that trick for so long. We'll call... <laughs> no, I, I, I turned it off. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that, so that observation is, is correct, Tim. But is there a question that follows from that? Yeah, well, sort of slightly a discussion, but I'd like your opinion on it is because I suppose what I've noted is that um, especially groups, the main groups, especially in the UK, tend to have a quite a strong vegan um, sort of uh, undercurrent going so that their campaigns tend to perhaps, you know, focus on welfare treatment, but drag people in or draw people in into, uh, uh, you know, a vegan position, which... Um, Similar to what you've talked about before, about uh, the, that sort of where Francione maybe missed a trick by you know, not being able to abolitionise those campaigns. Uh, whereas, you know, I think uh, some of these campaigns look quite effective. They talk a lot about treatment. I was just thinking, is that because we're so used to, to use in our society? We use transport, for instance, all the time. We use a lot of you know services and it's only when they go wrong or when they look perhaps you know uh, like transport you know if you're getting on a bus and it looks like it hasn't passed its mot it's only then when it really jars and you sort of take note of using it at all hmm. so i'm saying what i suppose i'm putting is, is that when you focus on cruelty and you're using the language of cruelty treatment it jars people but when you talk about use, because people are so used to using stuff, it doesn't really jar people so much. And is that maybe why activists often choose to talk about the treatment? Um, and indeed use strong words like violent language to jar people, mm. where then it's followed up by a, a look in a perhaps a more educated form about whether it's right to use animals. Well... Thank you for that simple and uh, short question, Tim. Um, it's um, it's a complicated issue here, but I actually, my, in my experience, it's the other way around. I tend to think that if you talk about animal use, it jars, whereas people are quite used to talking about animal cruelty because that's the normal way that society talks about animal use in the first place. But I think the general point is that no words are banned here. And I mean, like um, Tom Reagan would talk about... Um, uh, animal cruelty but the framework was always about animal use and animal rights and so it's not as though you kind of need to censor yourself and not use a phrase so it's not as though you know you can't use the word cruelty you can't use the word suffering or treatment uh, I mean Reagan used the word treatment quite quite regularly but if it's framed within within a rights based position which is based on making it very clear that the end the end game is to end all animal use, then it, then it tends to be uh, okay in my view. It's just that um, what you find in the movement is that uh, you could have an entire conversation, a YouTube channel 
or whatever, which is entirely um, uh, dedicated to the notion of uh, we're opposed to animal cruelty, we're opposed to animal suffering, and th and there's no kind of general kind of philosophical context for that, and that that's that's the bit that I find uh, it would be it would be beneficial to have that kind of wider uh, context. If you if you if you were to do, for example, a content analysis of the literature and the discourse of the animal rights movement, you wouldn't find the phrase um, rights violations very often, whereas that is the core idea of the case for animal rights. So, you know, we, we can use any words we like, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't ever kind of bury the core idea, that, and, that, and that would be my... Oh, we lost your mic again, Roger. And I think to that point, I think... I think it's important to understand why we're using these words, because my understanding is that a lot of times when people say um, animal cruelty, uh, suffering and animal abuse, I don't think they necessarily have connected that to um, Peter Singer's utilitarianism that doesn't actually call for an end to all animal use and actually allows for one possible solution being humanely killing them. And this is, you know, one of the key influencers out there. So that's um, a, a key point there, too, that if we are going to use these words, it should be tethered. I think Tim made a really good point around our want to jar people. And I think all of us, we want to get people thinking. That's why we're animal advocates. And to me, it's not just saying animal use in isolation. It's tethering it to something that's more jarring, still with that objective animal rights-based versus the utilitarian-based end goal. And the thing I like to do is just talk about the completely unnecessary breeding or killing. And as Roger mentioned, rights violations. I mean, I think if we're looking to jar, jar people and get them thinking, I can't think of a better way to do that than talking about violating someone's rights. Well, I tend to agree with you. And I think, I think the danger about using either rather loose talk of sort of treatment that doesn't directly make the point that we're, we're trying to end the use of animals, so that's the key message. Um, or indeed, that kind of aggressive, hostile, attention-grabbing language, that slightly pat, shouty, screamy language that, that um, from my experience, I've seen, even if delivered in quite, um, quite a calm, calm tone, um, can be very much raised defences. So I've noticed, for instance, if you talk about the use of animals, um, Perhaps somebody listening or perhaps a radio interview, you know, you talk about the use of animals doesn't tend to jar. If you mention, if you talk about the exploitation of animals, mm. that can quite quickly jar somebody into, oh, hold on, you know. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. At what point can language put people off and raise those defences? And, and it, indeed, is that a good thing? Sometimes that's what, you know, I suppose what you might call fragility. It's like, oh, how dare you suggest I might be exploiting an animal? And then, you know, does does the process then think, hmm, actually, you know what, maybe, you know, that's... So I think it's an interest in how we use language, how much we jar people, how much we come back to that underlying principle. I think Allison's back from her coffee break and might have something to add here. Allison from Bloomington, Indiana, do you have any thoughts around oh. using jarring language and how we should use it strategically? It's Welcome back to the show, by the way. Yeah, it's an international <laughs> show here, and I do have my second cup of coffee. It's good. No, it is, it is so interesting. I mean, I've learned a lot from my brother, Jeremy spoiler alert, we're siblings, um, about, about this topic because typically on bumper stickers and t-shirts and stuff, you see cruelty, you see abuse, and that's what people chant at protests. And so that's what people think of as wanting to stop. But of course that's not enough because you can treat someone really well and then of course um, the next step is still not okay. Um, so it's really interesting. I do think it's important for animal use to be a more a part of the conversation and I mean, it's all about being strategic and knowing as best you can who you're talking to and what they may respond to. And I mean, it's all really interesting. Human beings make things interesting, that's for sure. This is another one I've thought about quite a bit and the mental gymnastics are, are at play for sure. Yeah, and I, get, I think the question we should all be asking ourselves is should we be focusing on the suffering or should we be focusing mm -hmm. on the breeding and killing? Because to mm -hmm. me, that's the core question because within in the framework of focusing purely on suffering, you can make the humane 
argument and humanely, like you say, mm -hmm. take care of them and then humanely kill them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, going back to what I said before, I think some flexibility of language is, is okay. It's just the fact that if you skew it far too much, you know, like, like Alison said, you know, if you talk about cruelty all the time, then mm -hmm. people get in their minds that what you're after is non-cruel use which from a sociological point of view is a major problem because that's the the kind of promise of animal welfareism that you can get such a thing as non-cruel use and so if you if you're not careful you can approach people and they think that's what you're after as well mm -hmm. so you you've got to make sure that you kind of like make sure that they they don't think that you're in that paradigm that you that you kind of make them aware that you're actually standing outside of that you know mm -hmm. and um one way you can do that is by talking about a range of views and that's when you can then explain the kind of core difference between say welfare and rights for example and um i i use street um encounters if you like as um, a means to educate you know and i te i tend to say well you know it, you know if, if people are coming at me with welfare i kind of say well you'll make an animal welfare point there you know we're an animal rights group and so the difference between those two things and etc cetera, etc cetera. and that and that's how i would proceed and it would it would make it a kind of educational kind of um um encounter i suppose that's that, that, that that's what i would i would aim for anyway but i certainly wouldn't go to shame people it's not necessary to hold anybody to account and all these kind of modern ideas and certainly you wouldn't do anything in an aggressive way because you can't um this is what we got from reagan you can't educate somebody in an aggressive way you know well, I think there's ways that we can use some of these jarring terms in a, a way that's a bit strategic. For instance, one um, tactic I've heard that's quite um, good is if we say, you know, if, if we were to do this to a human, what would we call it? And then it allows them to kind of connect the dots and break down the inherent speciesism within our language. That's one tactic mm. out there for people to consider. Uh, that, that is a very interesting thing in terms of language. I, I did a video not long ago about um, the, the, the kind of um, trigger trigger areas in our ag advocacy you know words like uh, rape holocaust slavery the, these are all kind of trigger trigger issues and um, but if you can talk about an issue and the audience say wow that sounds like you know uh, slavery that sounds like mm -hmm. a holocaust you know mm -hmm. that that seems to be okay uh, be, because they, they have cr they have created that uh, connection in in their minds without you explicitly doing it for them, mm -hmm. and and also I I'm very worried actually about this idea that you have to you have to align it to some type of human exploitation for it to count as though mm -hmm. the the fact that the the other animals have been exploited and have their rights violations uh, rights violated in itself is is not an issue a big enough issue for us to get over to people without saying oh this is like a human thing you know i th i i've always been a bit worried about that about making those analogies all the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they are useful though yeah and i think wendy has a great point along those lines around um our view of um uh, looking at um those who aren't vegan with derogatory terms such as we mentioned corpse muncher earlier i think another one that's i've been seeing seen coming up in the comments is um, Carnist. Mm. How, how much do you think the, I'll, I'll direct this towards Roger maybe, how much do you think those kind of um, things uh, create a, a separate? Oh, it looks like the, Tim's dropped out here. <laughs> um, and it looks like, um, I, I mean, I guess, how much do you think we should be trying to pull people together? And how much do you think some of those terminologies uh, might divide us? Well, that actually goes back to what we said before about context. You've got to kind of, you've got to kind of judge it as as you go. But the thing is, you know, um, we are social animals, which is why this Corona thing is is being so painful at the moment because we can't do what we normally do, which is interact uh, in in you know various forms of intimate levels. Um, so we we can't do that. But we are social animals, and so we can pick up on cues. And when you become vegan, you don't stop becoming. Um, a social animal. A lot of people kind of accuse vegans of that in the sense that, oh, you, you lose your uh, ability to communicate. And, you know, communication is, is, is what we do as educators. It's very, it's very kind of important, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's all kind of wrapped up uh, uh, in this kind of issue that, that, you know, we still need to communicate. And that means that we need to 
speak in a language that people understand, at the same time, we need to challenge them. I mean, I'm a big fan, mm -hmm. as probably people know, of Donald Watson's idea of ripening people up, which basically means you need to talk mm -hmm. to them about things that challenge them. But of course, the more it challenges them, the more you've got to be careful about how you challenge them. Because, you know, um, the challenging part is not the problem. It's kind of, it's more to do with how you go about it that might be the problem, seems to me anyway. Yeah, and I think uh, Mika's raised a, a good point here around um, the term carnist and where that is coming from. Because I think before we approach any of these topics around language, I think we have to make an important decision. And that's, and this is something I know I've had to do myself, is making that decision between advocating versus venting. And I think if we're really, you know, one of the strongest things to influence whether or not someone will actually take a change on board, such as Living Vegan, is their relationship with the change agent, which is us. And if we automatically, you know, risk having that negative um, framing from the get-go by calling them a carnist, um, and I appreciate this is usually tossed around in vegan circles. However, I do th I have seen it directly used um, towards people who are not vegan. I, I do mm. think that some of those people may seriously be considering veganism, even though it's. I think we'll all agree that's a really hard thing to tell on social media. But you know, we could lose them when otherwise mm. that could have been a constructive exchange. Yeah, I agree with that, Jay. It's all about um, attracting people, attractivism to this movement and this way of living. And it's really important that we don't inadvertently or um, purposefully cross that line into shaming anyone. Shame being the feeling not just that my actions are bad, but I'm bad. And so particularly with the issue of consuming animals, the majority of us were born into that mentality, right? And so we spent however many years of our life consuming animals. And so not only the the whole worldview um, is a part of what we've experienced, but it's actually our being. I mean, we've taken in their bodies and it becomes a part of who we are. And so I think it's so easy to feel, I mean, I know for years I felt a lot of shame about being a part of that. And so it's so important that we make this a positive thing and that we're really supportive because it it's a lot emotionally to work through the fact that, you know, first you recognize what's going on and then, oh shit, I've been a part of it. I mean, I've, I've, I've directly been a part of it and so we have to support each other we can't you know we can't put each other down it's hard enough yep mm. do you have any thoughts around that roger as, well, that was as, a, as far as framing that was, a, <laughs> that, that was the second shit we had in the in the oh there's another one hopefully we're not doing too much of that we all know about the toilet paper situation <laughs> <laughs> in in re, in relation to shaming, um, I mean, I think it's an interesting that you know you you feel shame. I think I think it's obviously a problem if you if you set out to try to create shame. And I think uh, I think some advocates <coughs> try and do that. They try and shame people. They try to make them feel guilty and stuff. What I do say about that is um, an echo of one of my blog entries, which is um, shaming and criticizing are not the same thing. But it but it can be a kind it can be a kind of um, a thin dividing line between the two. So I think it's something you've got to be very careful about. And again, linguistic skill, but also even something like a, a human thing, like diplomacy. These things are important, you know, mm -hmm. when you talk to people. I mean, we're, we're social animals. We should use that. I mean, that's, that's, that's our skill, that's our tool, right. you know, and we need to be able to use the fact that we are, and we can pick up on cues, or they can pick up on our mm -hmm. cues. Um, we're good communicators. It's one of the things that humans do, although ironically, the language can be very kind of difficult too. It's, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's an interesting academic uh, subject. You know? Yeah, and uh, Taryn's raised a good point around um, alternatives to use is actually back to your point around um, exploitation that I think was raised earlier. And it, it seems like a lot of people are kind of um, on board with that whole idea of not um, framing our entire uh, position specifically around cruelty because um, that could imply that whole um, non-cruel use alternative. Mm. Can, and, can, we, can we just review the, um, the comments, Jeremy? Because I think... Uh, yeah, I, I'm, ju I'm just catching up on, my, on them myself. So if you are just joining us and you do want to join us via video chat, if you drop an X and I'll um, paste the link again so you can join us. Otherwise, if you would like to um, just type your question, um, mm. it's just best if you add a Q before that actual uh, question. I'm just, I'm just concerned that we might have missed a couple because I did see one before if people saw me leafing through my Denea thing, because somebody somebody brought up a, the question about hair. Did you see that one about, 
about hair. So, um, oh, as far as hair versus fur. Yeah, mm -hmm. Vic Victoria Freedom. Have you, have you got? Can you see that one? I'm not seeing it at the moment, but uh, um, you, but, I mean, we can ch we can chat about it until I, I find it. I mean, I think that's you, a really you'll good have point. to scroll back to the thing where they're talking about the two book titles, so it's that far back. Okay. Yeah, and so oh, here um, we go. I've got it. Should we refer to animals' hair as fur? hair and not fur. And I think that is a really interesting segue to a whole host of topics. And for me, I would say default position is yes. And I think there are some contexts where we might um, choose to still strategically say fur. And when we're concerned, they might not know what we're um, talking about. However, I think for the vast majority of contexts, I think the more we can um, use the same language that we would for humans as we would for our fellow animals, I think that's a, a, a great way to try to break things down and there's mm. there, there's so many examples of this isn't it you know when we refer to our dog friends um you know instead of their paws their feet you know instead of their snout their nose all these things i mean there's lots yeah. of examples another one you brought up with me recently jeremy was the idea of taking um your family member to the veterinarian versus the doctor why do we classify this medical care in different terms yeah exactly Mm, animal doctor, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? You know? Yeah. Mm, pet detective. The, um, Ace Ventura, classic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah especially where, where he, uh, he throws the woman around, around his shoulders and he uses her like a, a stole, you know, like a fur stole thing. Yeah. But, but going back to... <laughs> that movie's <laughs> going back a few years, isn't it? Go, go I, I, Alice and I used to know that movie, every line of that movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is okay. no joke. <laughs> we absolutely did. Yeah. Well, do, 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 do you want to give us a section of it now? <laughs> I'm, I'm Horn and Finkel. <laughs> wow. Where the heck came from deep in your childhood, didn't it, Al? <laughs> it uh, Last go, century, even. <laughs> go, going, back, going back to Victoria's uh, issue here, yeah. Um, Joan Denea, she uses that. She talks about hair. And I was trying to find it in this thesaurus. That's why I've been... Um, uh, disengaged for a thing, but I can't. I can't find it, unfortunately. But she she does have a um, a section on uh, on the fur industry, which she calls the pelt industry. So she wouldn't use the word fur; she uses the word pelt, which is an interesting one. So she would say, for example, don't say fox coat or mink coat. You say fox pelt coat, mink pelt coat. That that kind of, that kind of idea. Um, fur meaning part of a pelt, fur collar, you would call that a pelt portion. You know, it's really, it's really kind of, you know, Joan Denea's thing is quite interesting. I, I, I reviewed this book, I think it's 2001, I reviewed the book um, for a magazine called Art News. And I said that I could never see it catching on. I, I, I said, I think it's going to be too complicated for, for animal advocates to, to use the, this language. Um, mm -hmm. because it is, it, you know, you've got, you've got to be, you've got to kind of like learn it really as, as almost like a new language, which itself then is a problem because if you speak completely alien to people that there, there, mm -hmm. there, there is, there is, um, an audio, it's, it's called animal voices. If you Google Joan Denea animal voices, you'll get it. It's an audio of Joan Denea. And, um, I think I sent you the link this morning, Jeremy, but, um, if you listen to Joan Denea talk, it does kind of like throw you off quite a lot and the, and the interviewer was kind of you know you could you could hear the fact that she was struggling to keep up and mm -hmm. so if you use language which is totally alien to people then you're going to lose them mm -hmm. so it's a it's a balance it's that context thing again but it's that thing about being a, a skillful social animal and that you know if you I mean, like, if you're having a conversation, it's probably happening to everybody in this call now. If you're having a conversation where you're starting to lose people, you can see it in their eyes, you know, and then, and then you... It then over. You, yeah, <laughs> then, then you, then you kind of comp compensate, you know. And the whole idea behind watching body language is important too. Yeah. If someone crosses their arms or steps away or loses eye contact. Absolutely. Yeah, but we're, we're, absol we're absolute experts at body language. We're really good at it. You know, that's one, one thing that humans are, you know. Yeah, and uh, Camila has a good question for you, Roger, around any materials around this whole idea of ripening people out, up, which has been kind of a theme throughout this whole call. Is there anything specifically that you would direct them to? Yeah, if you go to the very first, um, uh, what is it called, uh, the Vegan News 
from 1944, uh, which was written uh, by Donald Watson. So it's the very first thing that the Vegan Society um, as an entity kind of put out, really. Um, so you can easily Google that. Just put uh, the Vegan News 1944 and you'll get it. It's kind of, um, you can get you can get like a typed one now, but you, uh, you can get like um, a computer version now. But you can also get the um, scanned version of the original thing, which was done on a kind of Gestetner kind of, an old-fashioned kind of thing, um, uh, which has a few kind of uh, typos and that in it. Did but you say Gazetna? Yeah, Gaz <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're doing a we're doing a live stream about language that people will understand, Roger. <laughs> I, said, I think I think I said Gazetna, right? Gazetna. It's a Gazetna print. It's a printer. <laughs> Do you know, do you know, uh, does anybody know what I'm talking so about? So, for anybody yeah. listening, printer <laughs> over Gazetna. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> this is show, this is showing my age. What what you would do is you would put you would put this thing into into like a typewriter, and you type onto it, and and the letters would print through it, and and create create like a template, and then you'd peel the back off it, and then you put it onto this Gestetner printer, which which kind of went round and round. You could even do it by hand. Some some of them. And um, that's how you do early early printing. I used to do that in the 1980s, you know. Oh. So it's early to anyway. It's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> As you've often said to me, Roger. Yeah, yeah. Less is more. Yeah, <laughs> less is more. But, um, yeah. 1944, the Vegan News. That's where this ripening up idea comes from. And Whoa. actually, funny enough, in relation to what we've talked about already, he talks about it directly in relationship to the anti-slavery campaign. So the, uh, there you go. Okay. Make of that what you want. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and Allison, you're welcome to join us for a few more of these if you'd like. If you're uh, sticking around, if you get low on coffee, let us know and we'll we'll uh, give you a grand goodbye. But in the moment... Oh. But you're not allowed oh, to I... say shit, shit anymore, okay? All right. <laughs> we, said it, we said it four times now. <laughs> And rapidly counting, Carlo asks, the Vegans of Color project book, Veganism is an impressive, uh, Oppressive World, talks about the need to do away with language that relates to specific instances of human oppression slash suffering, such as uh, the Holocaust. Do you agree with this? I remember you guys citing the Eternal Treblinka as an influ influential book in last week's, week's stream. I think that's a question for you, Roger. That's kind of your specialty, mm. isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think it's a difficult issue. I think that... Um... I think the pre precision of language is important here, um, just to make a serious point for once. Um, in, <laughs> in, in, in the sense that um, I think you could probably get away with saying the animal holocaust, which some advocates say. The only problem is that this is ethnomethodology again. When you hear in any context the word holocaust, you hear the Jewish holocaust. So that is the, that is the difficulty. That that you, that you're 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 creating an allusion to the Holocaust. So, the Holocaust is the Jewish Holocaust, but there is such a thing as an Holocaust. But these things get easily confused. And then there's a second kind of more technical thing uh, that makes me avoid using Holocaust too much. Although again, I think using the animal Holocaust could be defended. I think. Um, but what I tend to do is not use that terminology very much in the sense that um, it's technically incorrect. The, the Holocaust was about eradication of categories of human beings. So we've got obviously Jews, but also homosexuals, so-called gypsies, Romanies, etc. So there was categories of human beings that the Nazis were trying to eradicate. That's the actual opposite of what we do we actually bring beings into existence in order to exploit them. So it's kind of a different thing going on there. So that's a kind of, te a kind of technical answer, I suppose, to that. But th th those things, I mean, the general point, the beginning of, of, of what was on the screen there, I agree with that we don't, we don't really need to keep kind of making these connections because I think we can explain animal use and the rights violations of other animals mm -hmm. sufficiently if you like, on their own. 
but I think it's also natural for us to do it. We kind of do make connections. We that's that's how we talk generally speak. Well, that's a little bit like this, and that's that's what we think about. You know, that's what you do when you're when you're having a conversation. You you make connections. Um, it's called indexicality in academic terms. We we do that. It's almost as though we've got all these index cards, and somebody says a word, and you've got all this indexicality going going on. It's like you've got a thesaurus in your head. That's that's what's going on. Well, it's a good point because when we're first trying to communicate an, an issue that for most of us is, you know, we're very aware of to someone who's never thought about it before, um, trying to make that connection. I think that's where a lot of these relationships come from. I know early in my um, advocacy, I avoided those comparisons entirely and would advocate against it. And I've, I think I've evolved my position in the sense that I think during longer interactions where we do have that opportunity to dismantle the speciesism, behind saying, oh, Holocausts are just reserved for humans, the technical point aside around the end goal, but just from a perception perspective, one could argue that, you know, that, that you know, that there is, like you say, a case to be made for saying the animal Holocaust. However, well, what about, what about slavery? I mean, I mean, yeah, I think we'd I, all agree, wouldn't we, that other animals are enslaved. We would yep. use that word, wouldn't we? enslaved, right? So isn't that therefore implication that they are, they are subject to a form of slavery? See, and I think knowing know, our audience is, you know, as, as all white people, you know, if we're addressing someone, a person of color, do we really want to be chucking these words around? And, and all of a sudden you're, you know, opening this whole other topic up. Yeah, has nothing I'd, to I'd do agree. With, well, not nothing, agree. but it's not the focus. Of the mm, philosophy I'd, I'd agree very strongly with that. But um, somebody like Francione has, has pointed out that um, in the modern world, it could quite well be that uh, there are more white persons enslaved at the moment than black persons or people of color. I think I think this gets us into a terribly difficult area, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's also the idea or the comparison or the parallel of uh, cows on dairy for dairy farms being forcibly impregnated or the other word for that, which is rape. So that's another one that when you say that to people who have never thought about it that way, it is very jarring and upsetting. But from just you, you, you think that impregnated is, is a problem as well as the other one? No, no, I don't. Oh, okay. no. Right. no, more the the term rape. Yeah, I think especially survivors of assault might, you know, question that. However, I mean, it does go back to the idea of kind of helping people, ripening them up, um, you know, giving people food for thought, if you will. Um, and so I think there is an argument to be made that using these terms sometimes can help people make connections like, oh, that is... That is what's happening. And I mean, it's interesting, too. I um, I have five hens that are in my care and they're wonderful. And they just two of them started laying eggs. And so um, one of them yesterday laid her first egg and it was just it was awful it, for three and a half hours. She struggled and it just, mm. you know, it made me I thought about I won't get into this. Don't worry. But, you know, issues as a female with reproductive things that have happened in my life. And so you just, you can't help but look at their struggle and see your mm. own and vice versa. So there is something to be said, I think, for those comparisons. But you do also mm. have to be careful, careful if you're not a part of a group um, using terms like slavery, I think, you know, you've got to- Yeah, well, I agree. I agree be with Be mindful that. about it. Yeah. 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 Well, and especially uh, uh, with mass media, when your audience is everyone. Mm -hmm. Go, going back to the, uh, the hens, chickens, uh, Alison, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a work of somebody called Robert Grillo. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, he he talks a lot about that because not only have we, as as it were, kind of selectively bred and genetically engineered mm -hmm. um, these birds to produce far more than they would normally, but they mm -hmm. also produce uh, eggs which are far larger than they should right. be, and even for their right. for their skeleton, really. And they go through a terrible amount. I mean, I don't. I, I often wonder if, if, if an egg eater saw an egg being laid, whether they would want to consume it, to be honest. Right. Well, yeah. I, I've, I've heard, go ahead, it's Al. a gift and it's simple and it just kind of falls out. But I can tell you from yesterday's experience, it's, it's no, not true. That's not true, no, no. Yeah, Free From Harm is Robert's organization. That's and it, yeah. He actually, yeah. yeah, he actually um, connected with Uplands Peak, the sanctuary I mentioned earlier, and brought a wonderful rooster to us years ago, um, Bodhi. He actually died a few months ago, but he had wonderful years at Uplands Peak. So yeah, Robert's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I cornered him in an elevator at the Animal Rights Conference 
um, two years ago and told him how much I liked his book and it was like 6.30 in the morning. So apologies <laughs> to Robert Grillo for that one, but you know. <laughs> well, if, if people want to check out uh, an audio of, uh, of Robert uh, as an intro to him, you could always uh, Google um, Animal Rights Zone podcast, Robert Grillo, and you, you get that. I've heard good things about that podcast. Have you? Yeah, I have. One or two, maybe. <laughs> So here is another question from Elliot who asks, do you think that the corporation, corporization of the movement and the individual activists using this as a job to make money leads to the problem with language because fundamentally they care more about keeping up appearances than being effective for um, other animals? And I, yeah, I guess adding to that, that if we're trying to get um, from a donor pool that includes people who aren't vegan, are we actually, you know, taking our level down a notch by ap appealing to the donor pool rather than, as Elliot points out, advocating for the animals? I, I might have something to say about this issue, Jeremy. <laughs> this wouldn't be an issue uh, close and close to your heart, would it, Roger? No. It's something no. You should have asked. Roger. All right. <laughs> um, I mean, this is this is an issue close to the heart of anybody who's looked at social movement theory. So Corey Wren, Corey Lee Wren would be another person who's uh, done some recent um, uh, work uh, and not least podcasts um, in this area. And so the general kind of feeling about corporatization is that when a social movement uh, professionalizes and becomes more stable and, um, and all that and gets into things like wages, offices and all that kind of stuff, then they tend to moderate um, and then they start to be very careful because they don't want to upset their subscribers and the bigger they become and the more overheads they they get the more of a problem it is in that respect and so some of their core values could become threatened and, and often are there's some classic examples in the animal movement peter would be the classic example of a once radical group that becomes a welfare corporation in a more general social movement sense, Greenpeace International are often seen as that, a very radical group at first, and now a kind of multinational corporation, which Peter is too. So um, yeah, that is a problem. In terms of the individuals, um, I mean, if you're thinking about the kind of patron type people in terms of that, um, I think they've probably got a bit more autonomy in terms of their own claims making because they actually might make their name through a certain type of radical claims making so they would then not have that pressure to moderate so that would be an interesting variation on that i i would i would put the emphasis on the groups certainly when you start getting people grouping together and then they become involved in terms of their careers their terms of their income and everything mm -hmm. then there's a big push then for them to moderate whether, whether it would happen all the time with individuals i'm not sure so that's an interesting variable i think Mm. And another thought from Elliot, um, going back to our previous um, chat, is isn't the uh, need to make constant comparisons with human history actually human supremacist in itself? And I think that's an interesting one, um, similar to the comparison, comparing um, humans to other animals. Shouldn't they have mm -hmm. value in their own right without that comparison? So I think that's a, a strong point to mm -hmm. consider if for those who it, may it is a kind of natural thing. It is a kind of natural thing to do, though, isn't it? I mean, just yeah. as yeah, mm, yeah, we so. care more about our family members than other family no, members. No, it's not. I, I, it's I, each I, person. I didn't quite mean it that way. I meant it's just like the way that we discuss things uh, in, a, in a kind of natural sense. We we kind of appeal to history, or we appeal to comparisons. Mm. Or, you you know, I mean, it, I mean, like we appeal to authority, but I mean, history is seen as authority in that in that context, in discourse mm -hmm. sense, isn't it? Because we appeal to tradition, which is which is history, and so. I think it's bound up in the way that we speak to each other as well. So I think it's quite, quite difficult to negotiate that one uh, personally mm. on that one. Mm. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, this is by no means a, a, a discussion about saying any, any words are off limits. To me, I do like to think about it from the context of focus and scope and the words I choose to focus on, I think are the most objective and they'll be the quickest to see other animals as individuals, you know, with that vow claim to moral rights. However, I think a lot of these words can arrive at a similar end goal and should be still be in the scope of our language. I love that focus scope thing, by the way, Roger. I've, I've stole, I stole that from Roger, and I think I apply it to every situation I can now. 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> I learned one thing from you at least. <laughs> uh, what, can, what, what can I say? You might be the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've been talking to a lot of people all these. What is it? Forty-one years being an activist. Hopefully, hopefully, there's been some other learnings along the line. <laughs> just nodding the head. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just thinking of 41 years and age and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's that. It happens to the best to, to all of us, doesn't it? Yeah, what some, about, of, what some about, of us more than others, I suppose. Well, so, <laughs> some of this, uh, uh, going back to that, that the, this document, um, what about uh, the whole concept of one, one word I try to swerve is um, saying um, test animals? And even vivisection to an extent, because I think it might be a bit of a foreign word. Um, and I, I, I was just wondering if there's any thoughts around replacements for those, because victims mm. of um, needless surgery, or um, are just simply other animals who are killed through um, testing. I think. Well, go, going back, going back to AR Zone, there is um, uh, there is two podcasts. I um, can't remember which one it's in now, but there's a, there's a podcast with my sister Lynn Yates, and. Um, She's eight years senior uh, to me. I uh, went vegan around about the same time. And um, although she, she claims 1978, but it's more like 1982, Lynn. Um, oh, no. We've got <laughs> uh, fa fa family feuds coming out now. Um, but um, she makes that point that vivisection is too complicated. Um, she actually makes the point, and this is, um, could be criticized as kind of a bit elitist or classist is a sense that if you think about the tabloid mm -hmm. newspapers they tend to aim their reading age at something like um i think it's six or seven and so they're very careful in fact i used to know somebody who was employed by the bbc in manchester in england and their job was to take all the three syllable words out of the reporter's mm -hmm. um copy because most most people can't understand three syllable words and you'll see that um reflected in the tabloid press mm -hmm. so if you make a distinction with the broadsheets the and the tabloids there is a there is a thing that if we aim for the the tabloid or audience um then we're going to get a lot more people who could actually understand what the hell we're talking about <laughs> and so, social media too right i mean i think that's probably mm -hmm. the most accessible um form of advocacy to most of us mm -hmm. species we, speciesism I mean, this is why carnism mm -hmm. probably, I mean, carnism, I mean, I noticed on the, on the comments, people are saying it's a species term and all that. I mean, carnism is a vegetarian term because it talks about a subset, you know, Melanie Joy talks about a sub ideology of speciesism, which is carnism. So we're talking about part of the problem right from the, the get go, if you like. Um, but I think that carnism is easier to say. It's easy to think about. It, it comes over more of a bit of a slur. You're a carnist. Whereas if you say you're a speciesist, it doesn't have the same kind of visceral effect. Well, one of the other question is, could that imply that we're suggesting that humans are carnivores? Because I think we've all heard that defense. So are we actually empowering that, that, that case to mm -hmm. suggest, OK, yeah, I adhere to carnism because I'm a carnivore mm. and, I, and maybe wanting to swerve that. Mm. And I think mm. along the lines of vivisection, another one is um, around the, um, oh, we've got a <laughs> slight flick there of the screen, but um, we no, you you have there, <laughs> we have. <laughs> the royal we. Yeah. I'm clicking buttons and talking at the same time. That's what happens. Yeah, Another one I was going to bring up is you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, well, I don't chew gum, so I'm safe there. Ah, but, right. um but sentience is another one that I think, and talking about when we really starting to get, and, and to me, which is the core of the philosophy of animal rights, is building that case that other animals experience life. I think the word sentience is something that I only learned once I became an animal advocate. So is that something we want to be introducing people to? I mean, my tendency would be to talk about experiencing life and letting the person decide from there what that means, and then building the case. Well, that um, that little phrase that uh, Reagan repeats quite regularly is a good one there, isn't it? Um, do, you, do you know that verbatim? Do you know the thing about other animals are in the world? Do, do you know that one, Jeremy? I, I know of it. I Not verbatim, but yeah, basically the yeah, so it's kind of the world, of, uh, what happens to them matters to them. And, yeah, and that's so right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's right. <coughs> so that, although it's a bit long-winded in the same way as subject of a life as a phrase is long-winded, um, it certainly kind of does get over what you're really after. So if you take the time, say, on the street to say that, 
you know, I think I think part of the issue is that we're always. I mean, I suppose with Twitter and that, we we're, we're talking about kind of sound bites and polemic kind of um, concise, you know, things. Whereas some things just take a little bit of time to explain, perhaps you know, so. Yeah, I, I managed. To, I think I managed to pull up my sheet again. So the uh, another couple of ones here are um, around wild animal, beast, predator, or pest, and actually referring to them as free living beings. I think that's something that uh, most. Uh, I know Roger and I have been working on. I don't know if that's one you're, you work on yourself, Allison, but I think if we refer to wild animals, it really does kind of put them in a separate category. Mm. And I think it's really easy to slip into that, you know, predator, mm, well, people, pass, all that stuff. Right. Uh, things used to be a lot worse um, in my day, Jeremy, in the sense that um, you would get things like lower animals being said, you know, beasts. Mm. Um, you know, still happens um, with humans, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, but you know, you'd get all that. I mean, I don't, I don't like the phrase "wild animals." Actually, I always say "free living beings." Mm -hmm. um, mm. And and you can't see the top of the page here um, for our viewers, but it is um, the the suggested phrase on the left to replace the um, ones on the right, and then a bit of an explanation there. So, well, oh, it, I thought it was the other way around, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want, to, <laughs> yeah, doing a talk about language and confusing people right off the bat, yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, the free living being terminology. I haven't thought about this one too much. And I still will, you know, make posts about the connections of veganism and the environment and talk about wildlife. And I'm sitting here now thinking about how the term wildlife is very, um, it, I mean, it takes away the individuality of anyone you're talking about. And you're talking about a bunch of individuals. So wildlife, I think, is a term. What, I'm what, what about rewilding? That's another one, isn't it? Mm. Uh, interesting yeah so much to think about i mean it, it to me seems really important that all of us involved in this movement just know that we are going to continue learning and that we're open to learning and it, it's kind of fun it's you know it's it's a continual process well i think that's a that's a really um something that's really resonates with me because i think at first i was thinking oh how am i going to do this it seems like such a chore and actually just having fun with it and just being a bit creative yeah. and just being open to to flow with it Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. F from um, again, you know, we would call it reflexivity. You know, the idea of just kind of like being self-critical, but critical in a general kind of sense. Um, critical thinking um, doesn't doesn't mean you know slagging off. By the way, it means you know thinking reflexively, thinking with um, uh, with you know being thoughtful about things. And you can you can then actually have fun with that rather than see it as a Oh God, you know, I mean, a lot of people are kind of, oh, you PC people and all that kind of stuff. The, the thing about the thing about PC language, which is kind of like feeds into some of this, is the fact that you're trying to figure out how to talk about the world and in the world in a way that doesn't harm others. And that's a good thing, you know, so it mm -hmm. might be a bit of a chore. Um, but, you know, just lighten up and, go, you know, go, go with it because it... it the actual aim of that is really good. The fact that you don't want to harm people. You know, people kind of think that language, some some people think this is, I mean, this is very kind of prevalent in, in discourse about ableism. But, you know, people think that, oh, well, the problem is that you're being offended by it. It's, that's, not, that's not it. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of causing offense. It's a question of causing harm. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you use ableist terms, it's not that you might be offending somebody. Is that you might be taking them back into an incredibly harmful situation mm -hmm. where because you know if you think about domestic violence and other issues of interpersonal violence um words that are used during that are very powerful and long lasting can stay with people forever you know so if they if they ask you please don't use that word then don't mm -hmm. because it's not that they're being offended is that they're being harmed and we shouldn't do that mm -hmm. to people you know interesting point yeah. and just to pull up with some of these with some more of these comments a great um conversation going on in the comment section as well which is so lovely to see that's really kind of what this we should we about. should go we should go back to it and here's a, a question from elliot is has the movement potentially become a movement about pity as opposed to empowerment and justice language mm -hmm. being a big part of this for oh. example the lack of rhetoric around uh, on uh, uh, around animals mm. I, I think that's a great point because it is very, um, it's not empowering them as individuals. Most of our I, language. I've got something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
well, it wouldn't be much of a show if you didn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but honestly, though, I'll tell you what, the name I hate the most in this movement, you'll know this. What, what is it, Jeremy? We're going to lose our core following here. <laughs> no, we, we, no, no, we won't. I mean, I just hate uh, the organization name called Mercy for Animals. I think that's a terrible name. Mm -hmm. Who thought of that, Mercy for Animals? We're not begging for mercy for other animals. We are demanding respect for their rights. And we're demanding mm -hmm. that people don't violate their rights. We're not begging for mercy. How weak and pathetic is that? I, I hate that. I really do hate it. Tell us how you really feel. No, <laughs> you, can tell we're, no. you can tell we're siblings. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, might get, I'm, I might get I might get riled up in a minute. <laughs> You're surrounded by Hesse, so be careful what you... <laughs> well, I think another interesting part of all of this conversation about language and it feeds into the pity, um, mercy conversation is in this movement, we're singular in that we are advocating for individuals who can't advocate for themselves mm -hmm. in human terms. They have voices. What? I'm not a fan of the term voiceless, but anyway, they yeah. have voices mm. with choose not to listen often but but this is a movement we where we're doing a ton of interpreting and presuming we know what they feel and what they want and so i think that leads into a lot of this as well it's it's a challenge yeah, yeah. At, a, at a minimum shouldn't we just um err on the side of caution and say hey we don't we might not know what they're thinking mm -hmm. mm, i mean um one of the planks of the uh the case for animal rights is is where appropriate give benefit of the doubt isn't it so we could do it we could do it now as well so you're right. mm. i think i think i think i think you're both right there yeah and a, a great point by taryn even companion man, companion animal is somewhat oppressive never thought of it before uh but donna haraway made the point which made me realize that we are defining the individual as defined by purpose mm. as companion so mm -hmm. i try not to mm. use non-human companion now i try to use non-human companion now instead and I think this, uh, Taryn's um, point has got me thinking that to me, back to Allison's point about having fun with this instead of considering it sure, I really like the idea of thinking of language chains and like we're pulling this chain in, we're getting new words as we go and just seeing what's next. I used companion animal for a while and then replaced it with animal companion to put the focus back on them as an animal versus them being a companion. And then I started to think from a flip it to test it perspective we wouldn't refer to necessarily our human family members as companions, although we might do. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. We've got a couple of siblings on this live stream. So really trying to use that universal language that we would use for both humans, you know, and our fellow animals. Mm. Well, on, on that very point, may, may I just read you a sentence or two from this, which is, um, Piers is saying, um, the same sort of egregious misdescription appears in many other categories as well, including laboratory animals, instead of animals used in laboratories, pets, mm -hmm. circus animals, and uh, racehorses. The last of these, mm -hmm. to offer another example, misdescribes as racehorses those horses who are used by humans to race against each other. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, by saying companion animal, it's kind of giving them a job, right? That's why people uh, have changed that to animal companion now. So that's the way it's worked. It's gone pets mm -hmm. to companion animals to animal companion. But, you know, if you say, uh, oh, you know, um, you know, um, uh, this, this it is a racehorse, that's giving them a job. Their mm -hmm. job is to race. Whereas in reality, we're talking about a horse who has been forced to race. Mm -hmm. or a greyhound who has been forced to race. Mm, absolutely. And I think here we've got um, some points around the companion part as well. Some some alternatives I like to use is just furry or feathery friend, because, Al, I think you have a few um, rescue hens at home I, there. I mean, I like to think of them as your feathery friends versus your, you know, chicken companions. Or, they, I, don't know, I haven't even thought about all the iterations of that one, not having chicken friends right, myself. Right. They, they call themselves my feathery, you know, bosses but yeah i get the point <laughs> <laughs> but, but bosses, it, i like that <laughs> isn't that it isn't that isn't that what well there's an issue there um but isn't um isn't that a problem isn't it a bit presumptuous to call them friends mm. it's a fair point even 
from a, a furry perspective, there's a bit of a division going on there. Yeah, it's, it's really tough with this thing. I think similar to other animals, there's not necessarily these, these perfect things. And I think that's the thing is to not try to find the perfect answers, but to just kind of be mindful and continuing to explore new options. Because I think for some of these questions, there aren't, there isn't necessarily a, a perfect solution. And Alison, didn't you did you say furry boss before just then? It, oh yeah, or feathered feathered boss. The chicken. Yeah, chicken. Is my point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, People, people say that about cats all the time, you know, um, you know, a, a cat is not my slave, I'm their slave, but actually that cat is your property and you could take them to the vet and have them killed mm -hmm. th this minute. They can't do that to you. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of, you know, it's a cute thing to say, but I actually think that's a bit of a problem. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. I was just sitting here thinking about, um, the fact that we hadn't talked about ownership yet and people all the time, especially dog and cat people say, oh, I'm so-and-so's owner. And that's one that really kind of gets to me. It's along the lines mm. of calling these individuals it. And so that's that's another good one to think about. I, I understand that legally um, my animals are my animals are my property, but but, that, I, but that, that's the subtle part of that argument though, isn't it? You, you it know, you, you, we might be very critical of someone saying, that they're the owner of someone but what are, what if they say as in you know my old chip my child you, my cat is that also a problem you know it's an interesting one that one right because we refer to other people as my my brother mm. right yeah and i think um De declan's got a, a point around that my internet's just jumping around so I'm, I'm trying to flick some bells and whistles here to see if i can get it get it back on track but the question is, why not say to people that we are all Earthlings when talking about animals and us? Like in the film Earthlings, um, say that um, says says and shows we are all in this ball floating in space and we are all one. And I think depending on the audience, that's a, a, a really good point. And I think uh, that's similar to the um, Fellow Creatures book that I mentioned earlier in, 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 in trying to create that uh, unionship. Mm -hmm. Well, um... I mean, first of all, a, a big a big shout out for Declan. Declan Bowen runs the Back into Daylight Animal Sanctuary in Ireland. So, um, actually, I, I like I like that new picture of you, Declan, because normally you're much more ugly than that. So, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but um, if every if everybody sees my YouTube channel, I always start by saying hello, Earthlings. But I used to start lectures like that at university. I used to just say um, hello, Earthlings. How are you doing? Kind of thing. And um, I think it's an, inter it's an interesting word to use, actually. It was very powerful. When Earthlings, the film, came out, I suppose it's worn off a little bit now. But that, that, bit, that bit at the beginning was very powerful, saying we're all Earthlings. It, mm -hmm. is, it, is, it is very true, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that more that unifying characteristic. Absolutely. And it looks like Ruby has a question around how do you feel about parent for people who have quote-unquote pets? I don't like this term and cringe when someone um, refers to me as a quote unquote dog mom. However, mm -hmm. I'm at a loss as to how to refer to myself in this context. I, I, I love that question, Ruby. That's great. Maybe I'll just jump in really quick for the whole mom thing. I also cringe with it because somehow it's not, I, I'm a caretaker and I provide a lot of the things that a human mom would provide to a human child, but somehow I find it diminishing because it somehow implies to me that I have all of these animals in my care because I don't have human children. So they're kind of the fill in because I can't or don't or won't have kids. And so it just, it's always, I've always bristled at it too. So thank you for asking the question. <laughs> the, um, the real problem here is infantilization mm. of, ad of adults yeah. because um, this feeds into that other phrase, which I really dislike, is fur babies, oh, you yeah. know, and, um, you know, um, who's going to adopt this boy and who's going to adopt this girl and this kind of stuff. It kind of infantilizes other animals, even if they're adults, you've got an elderly, an elder other animal in front of you and they're calling them boys. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it obviously feeds into the feminist thing about, um, and this is controversial, obviously, this idea of call, calling grown women girls and all this kind of stuff. But um, Certainly this kind of infantilization of other animals by keeping them as children all the time, 
I think it's a problem in terms of their status. I really do. Yeah, fur baby, I really don't, don't like fur babies. I never like that ever. And Elliot's got a good point around um, guardian over owner or mm -hmm. perhaps caregiver. Mm -hmm. I think it's some good points, and Taryn has some more points as well around this, um, as far as the word order being important, and similar to Roger's point around racehorse. And the interesting thing that um, I've thought about this is from an uh, animal companion perspective, I wouldn't necessarily refer to Roger or Allison as my animal companion, although I might do. <laughs> so it's, it's really kind of interesting to try to break down, you know, and to Roger's point from an ethno-methodological perspective, you know, what do people hear when they hear, the, uh, think when they hear these words? And I think being really mindful of that. It, it would be a fascinating experiment, a social experiment, wouldn't it? If you actually said, oh, um, hi, my name's Roger and uh, here's my animal companion, you know, uh, <laughs> referring to, a, a, you know, a human, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. because that would, um, that would really kind of uh, cross a few boundaries there, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I think, um, just being willing to experiment with the stuff. And I think we shouldn't be a, a, a afraid to ask each other within the movement, oh, what did you think when you heard me say that? You know, and, and really just kind of, cause we've got, you know, willing participants to, you know, quote unquote, experiment on, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause we all know how we feel about animal experimentation. But yeah, it's, it's um, really, just really trying to figure these things out. Um, usually, the usual thing I think when you start speaking, Jeremy is, oh, here it goes again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so note to self, don't ask Roger what he thinks. <laughs> Well, and another important part of all of this, I think the communication is listening because we um, we don't have all the answers and a lot of um, other, you know, others have answers to every species. I've learned a lot from the chickens that I surround myself with. And yeah, what, what did you say? <laughs> oh, that's there's that there's that Roger humor <laughs> rearing its head. <laughs> I did. Every, everybody was waiting for that, I'm sure. <laughs> I managed not to say it, so I've been trying to yeah. control myself. I know. I thought I'll get in there before Jeremy does. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who does the dad jokes. Yeah, <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah, I think another one I'd like to explore a little bit, if we could, is the whole concept of plant versus animal farmer. And before we get into that, mm -hmm. I think maybe if we target two hours for this. So in the next twenty minutes, if anyone does have any questions, or if you do want to join us by video chat, if you type an X, and I'll drop the link so you can join us. There seems to be a heck of a lot of things in the comments. Yeah, I, th I think I'm caught up on most of the questions. Just a quick note on some of the questions that didn't have to do with language. I think we're going to save those for next week, possibly if we do more of a general Q&A, just so we can stay um, more on mm. and really break down the language topic. Oh, there's a question I, coming up about, about so-called rape racks. That we, we ought to talk about that one. Mm. That, that's a really controversial one. That. I, th I think that was more of a, a side comment versus a question, but I can, yeah, I, we're happy to cover that one. Yeah, I think mm. that was in response to the discussion, yeah. And this is this, this particular one's around kind of the baby rhetoric mm -hmm. and, you know, referring to, to them mm -hmm. as babies, which, you know, from an empowering perspective is, is certainly going to have an issue. Mm -hmm. Which it's interesting. This is such a good point. It's interesting, too, though, as an activist, wanting to educate people about just in terms of days on the planet, most of those individuals going to slaughter are babies just age wise. Mm. So that is an important thing to let people know um, as far as what these animals go through. But yeah, the infantilization is, is such a problem. Yeah, actually there's um, pick, picking up on what Alison just said there. We, we had an issue once where this dairy farmer came up to the stall in Temple Bar in Dublin. And he said, it's not true that we separate calves from cows. And so I, I just asked him a few questions and got him to explain himself. Turned out that no matter what age they separate the offspring from the mother, they then saw the offspring as another cow. And so therefore, they never separated cows from cows a cows from cows. They only separated cows from cows. Interesting logic. Use of language. <laughs> use of language, yeah. Well, and that's, that's an important point. It's not just the language animal advocates um, choose to use, but it's also the language used uh, being used against us. Mm -hmm. And if someone says something that we think is actually reinforcing speciesism, anthropocentrism, any of these things, to actually say, well, I'm not sure I understood what you meant by that. Are you suggesting that, 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 fill in the blanks? Are you suggesting mm -hmm. that 
you know, humans are more morally superior, superior because of their intelligence, or what are you meaning to say by that? And really trying to, to not just <laughs> let these things go. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the point, I, I, the question I was talking about is we often hear about farming in the context of other animals. And I'm just wondering if we refer to the act as farming, if that could be diminishing what's happening here because we wouldn't necessarily farm humans. So the mm -hmm. thing I've started to think more about is in form, terms of animal use versus animal farmer. And well, also differentiating um, from uh, that and plant farming because, you know, we, we vegans, we love our chickpeas and our hummus. So we're not against plant farming. So really kind of creating a clear delineation there. No, that's one of the big points that Sandra Higgins from Go Vegan World would often make is that, you know, vegans are not the enemies of farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, one point I always make on the street is that there would be more farmers in a vegan world than there are now. So the, the farmers that um, are threatened by veganism are probably the mega farmers, the, mm -hmm. the ones that have bought out all the other farmers in the first place. So mm -hmm. in a vegan world, that, that, that really kind of is, isn't, isn't a problem, really. I, I don't think we, there would be kind of more farmers. Um, what uh, Benny Malone on Facebook has started to do is put an H in there so it becomes kind of harmers, farmers, harmers, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a kind of play on words type thing. And again, it's a political a political use of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah. So farmers become farm harmers or, you know, I, I'm not even actually sure. You, it's better to see it than to say it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and Shit. Jennifer just said, <laughs> there's another, the S-bombs dropping left and right. <laughs> It's interesting though. I mean, we, we don't want to end agriculture. We want to end animal agriculture. And Jeremy and I both come from a family where our grandpa was a farmer and he was a really kind, loving, wonderful man. And I'll never forget talking with him. I was in my early twenties and I asked him how he felt when he first sent um, the, the animals off the very first time. And he said, I cried, but I, wanted to feed my family. I needed to feed my family. And so, mm. any, you know, anyway, we're, we want people to have jobs. We want people to feed their families, but we also want justice. Mm, well, you know, we, there is a tendency to kind of um, call uh, animal farmers, harmers, uh, monsters in the, in the movement. Mm. Um, mm. You know, um, Harold Brown um, talked about that in the sense that he knew quite a lot of farmers that um, when it came to sending sending them off to the to the slaughter plant and that's another interesting use of, of language in ireland we call abattoirs factories we, we we're sending them to the factory you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. to, to hide the the thing i mean i suppose that the, the word ab abattoir um, is, is an interesting one in that sense but mm -hmm. um he would say that they would often take themselves to the far part of the of the um of the farm and, and you know find some kind of fence mm -hmm. you know miles away that uh, that needs fixing because mm -hmm. they that that part of it they found very distressing yeah you know and yeah. of course um i suppose the vegan reaction or a lot of people go well, who 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 gives who who gives an s about that but you know it it, right. it 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 does speak to what you just said there Alison, i think yeah well it's the misanthropy right it's the setting human um oppression aside. And another thing with what you were just saying, Roger, it made me think of the plight of slaughterhouse workers. I, I would argue no one wants to do that job. No one wants to spend their day slitting throats and dismembering bodies. And some people don't have other conceivable options. I, I, I think on that, there are, there are a couple of people who really get off on it, though. We, we, we knew somebody in, I think, one of the biggest um, slaughterhouses in Europe was in Wales, where I used to be an activist. And um, there was one guy reputedly really got off on working at the slaughterhouse and he kind of used it to intimidate um, sure. other, other men. He, 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 he would like to, um, to wipe kind of blood on the walls of the, uh, of, of the slaughterhouse. And he would even do things like ripping the toilets out of the, the floor. Yeah. He would, it, it, I think it was a kind of almost yeah. um, quintessential uh, yeah. example of kind of toxic, toxic masculinity. So I think there are some people who yeah. really do get off on, on, on yeah. that kind of job. That'd be the job you'd seek out if you were one of those personalities. And I think there's the, re the sad reality as animal advocates is there's going to be one to 2% of the population, perhaps more, that should not be our target audience. Yeah. 
Well, and I, I mean, just in terms of coronavirus now too, there are so many people sick that work in those environments and they need to stand close together. And so it's, um, all of these things are connected in so many, so many ways. Yeah, and back to the point around babies, Brad, Brad has a good point that around from a rights-based perspective, should we really be talking about their age? Because it's still right. a rights violation if they're, you know, in the case of um, male chicks in the egg industry, you know, who are, their mothers are used for their eggs. Um, well, ironic, ironically, that point is most relevant to the disputes or debates or discourse that goes on between vegetarians and vegans, you know, because it's often said that, um, for example, a dairy... A dairy heavy vegetarian would probably cause more animal suffering than a dairy light flesh eater mm -hmm. and and this is the reason for it is mm -hmm. that the the flesh consumer is um as it were putting the other animals out of their misery sooner mm -hmm. than an egg consumer or a milk consumer because of the way that these industries are, are kind of structured mm -hmm. so that's an interesting point that feeds into this point yeah yeah, I there think, was a um, thing from Jennifer there before about. Yeah, can you talk more about chickens? So I think uh, people like listening to your chicken stories, Al. So <laughs> any, any any language around any because because that's an interesting um, from Roger's perspective a sociological experiment because there's not too many people out there who care for chicken friends. You know, I appreciate how we talked about with the friend thing. However, um, you know, when you're talking to your friends, how do you refer to your furry and feathery family? Do you have any specific go-to words? Yeah, well, so we only have 10 minutes left, so I need to keep that in mind because I could talk about the girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, it's it's interesting. I typically, um, I use their names. I, I talk about Beatrice, Opal, Rosie, Jane, and Harriet. Um, and po po Point of order, they're imposed names by you, right? True, yeah, that is a good mm. point. That's mm -hmm. in construction. It's a way that I've individualized them just like we would a cat or a dog, but you're right, yeah. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if they've got names for themselves and each other. They probably which, which do. We, which we language. Know, yeah, I which know. we never know about. Yeah, they are That's so, a great point. They're so verbal, and this is why the voiceless thing doesn't ring true for me, because they are constantly talking to one another, and now with the egg laying in the mix, they, I mean, they are always checking in with each other, even if... Mm one or two of them is somewhere else in their yard. I mean, they're constantly connecting with each other. Especially, especially birds like ducks and geese, they're always chattering, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, so they, I'm sure that they do. Yeah, that's, it's a way though for me to individualize them and kind of normalize them like a dog or a cat as an animal companion, um, just like any other animal. And they're so, um, I've learned so much from them. They, you know, I heard another person who, runs a micro sanctuary, call it, you know, part therapeutic and part reparation. So I do, I feel like I'm healing something in myself while kind of giving back to these individuals that we, our society takes so much from, but they, um, they have individual relationships with each other for sure. So I have this flock of three who came to me first. They were in a factory farm in Colorado that had been um, shut down. And so all the birds were just kind of left there. And so those three, Rosie, Beatrice and Opal came about a year and a half ago and they were a flock. And then Jane and Harriet came um, just at the end of last year in December. So they've been with us just about six months. And so it is sort of a flock of three and then the flock of the younger two, but they are coming together in a lot of ways and they sleep cuddled together at night by choice. They have a pretty large coop. They don't have to all be together, but they choose that at night. And it's really wonderful the way they are with each other. And yesterday when Opal was having so much trouble laying the egg, Rosie was right with her and stayed with her and they, hunkered up next to each other and had their necks kind of wrapped around each other. I mean, anyone who would suppose or presume that chickens don't form bonds and have friendships is welcome to come to my yard anytime and hang out and just watch them. And um, Alison, do you think that um, sanctuaries ought to make a big kind of aviary type things with, with, I know the fencing is always a problem for sanctuaries and residents and, you know, brought brought there came there in all that kind of but you know um uh chickens at at the eden sanctuary they'd love to roost in trees wouldn't it wouldn't it be good for mm -hmm. sanctuaries to do that for chickens yeah 
Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think that some sanctuaries do. Karen Davis with United Poultry Concerns has talked about that a little bit. Um, some sanctuaries do. There is a distinction to be made between the, quote, laying hens and the, quote, broiler birds, um, only in that these Cornish crosses that I care for, the white birds who would have been meat, they have been bred, as we all know, to get very large. And so them yeah, getting- kind of too, too, heavy, too heavy to fly, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so there is some stuff to think about in terms of that. But yeah, the, the roosting and trees would be really cool. And I bet some sanctuaries have done a lot of that. It would be neat to see pictures and, and, and think about that more, kind of making the environment. They would yes. Sorry, uh, Jeremy, for derailing the conversation yet again, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, I tell, I, I, I tell you what, just, just, just on sanctuaries, one thing we should come back to, not now, but come back to, I'd want to explore the idea of um, open days at sanctuaries because there's some sanctuaries that won't let the public in because they say this is the home of the residents and they don't consent to have mm. their homes invaded by human beings. Mm. That's a really interesting one. It and it's a tricky one also when we're trying to tell tricky, um, yeah. other animals stories, even if it's just on an individual basis. You know, yeah, the, I mean, the it, core you know, focus of my work is telling mm, other animal stories yeah, at Sanctuary. It's, it's a tricky one, okay. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Jennifer. Bye, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy's saying this is so interesting. Can we do another hour? <laughs> Might have to do a bladder check for that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I win. Yeah. Hour. I want to watch what happens. <laughs> I, I need a pee. I need a pee. <laughs> Can we? Uh, I, mean, we could, I mean, we could come back to this very same subject next week, though. I think that would be great because we only got, um, for those who may be curious, I only got about halfway through this, this document. Um, <laughs> one thing that might be kind of fun to end on, there's a, qu a question from Wendy um, before we get to that is the, should we be avoiding emotive language and advocacy, especially mm -hmm. when trying to get attention in a noisy environment? humans respond more to slash from emotion more than reason. Usually we apply reason and logic after making choices made on emotion. Marketers know this all too well. Mm, Reagan, Reagan said that, that you need a blend of the two. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of says, he speaks to like a disciplined passion, doesn't he? Because if it's mm. all passion without discipline or all discipline without passion, it's kind of lacking. It's a question of drawing lines. And again, it's a question of the fact that we're social animals that so we could pick up on signals. And, you know, if you go in the wrong path, then it's a good idea not to carry on. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, it's a simple thing. You mm -hmm. know, um, like, you know, there's all this thing about, oh, you know, some people are not able to talk to people on the street, for example, and that kind of stuff. And that's an interesting one for me as a sociologist, because that's what we do. We talk to each other. That's mm -hmm. what we do. That's what being, you know, human is. I mean, we, we make such a goddamn big thing out of it. We've, we've got language. We speak to each other. Yeah. You know, and then suddenly we can't suddenly if we've got something important to say. I mean, what, we can only speak to each other about football or something. I mean, that, it, doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't follow for me, actually. Yeah, it's, yeah an interesting one. I and wonder that's... for some people. Oh, sorry, Jay. No, no, you go. I just, I wonder for some people, I've felt this, I think in the past that you, you want to make sure you have all your facts straight. You don't want to misrepresent everything. It's a big responsibility and a huge um, privilege to be able to speak um, and advocate for animals. And so I, I think sometimes people have a fear of, you know, getting it wrong or messing up. And so it's important, just like, we you know, we're all learning all the time, every single one of us, no matter how long we've been doing this. Um, if you get something wrong, that's an opportunity to, to think it through and do it differently next time. So you Absolutely. just get out that's, there. That's just life, isn't it? Yeah, it mm. is. Mm. Oh, and I th I, the thing I think, because I come at it from more of a logical perspective, the thing that's really helped me is to think about um, our morality and the philosophy of animal rights is, is it's entangled with emotion. You know, our, our moral decision making is highly influenced by our emotions. You know, I think that you really do need a mix of the two. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a case to be made. However, you know, obviously with that, that balance in mind, so it's not too much one or the mm. other. Well, if you go if you go to the Reagan 1988 uh, talk, um, sort mm. sort of in, is it sort of injustice or sort of justice? I, I always get that that wrong. But it's it's a 1988. There's a sword and there's justice. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's <laughs> that should get it to him. <laughs> the, the sword the sword of justice. But um, 1988 talk and Reagan was talking about declaring war on vivisection, but he talks about emotion there. He said, oh, you know, kind of we've got emo we're accused of having emotions, kind of shame on us, kind of thing. 
Mm. You know, kind of, kind of, you know, that's that's a ridiculous thing. Mm. You know, to 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 accuse to accuse humans of having emotions in a kind of deleterious kind of negative way. Well, yeah, I mean, we're we're a, we're emotional beings, you know. Mm. I mean, um, Hollywood. Um, Jennifer will tell you this. Hollywood knows how to pull my push my buttons. I I always cry at most Hollywood films. You know, I mean, like I mean, we're 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 emotional beings, but we need rationality too and logic and stuff. You know. Well, and and one thing I've heard suggested is, you know, if we do have an interaction with someone and our we get emotional, there I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know, um, you know, I'm getting this way because of this issue is very close to me and acknowledging that versus trying to push it to the side. You know, I, I, the, I, I, some of my best conversations have been with people when they start to get emotional. I say, you know what? It's OK. I feel that way, too. And it actually creates a safe space for them to explore those feelings versus shutting them off. Mm, I think my, maybe the issue is that um, there's a, a um, an interesting distinction between it being emotional and then being upset and then being too upset mm -hmm. to, to talk to people. I, I know several people who said that, oh, I couldn't do what you do on the street because I just get too upset and um i had mm -hmm. to withdraw from it or i would actually lose my temper with them yeah, i mean yeah. i've lost lost count it's kind of the earthling ed thing isn't it i've lost count of the, of the times that people said to me how do you keep your temper when people say that mm -hmm. and uh, i kind of think well what's the point of of losing your temper you know yeah and remembering who we're doing this for we're not doing this for us we're doing this for them you know, and I, that's something always in the back of my mind when I'm having conversations is, you know, if I'm frustrated or, I'm, you know, having somebody ask me where I get my protein for the 73,000th time, you know, actually, this could be the last thing keeping them from taking this thing seriously. So I mean, also it could be the first time they've thought of it. So it's mm. like, a, it's, it's, like a te them. it's like a teacher pupil thing, you know, like, I mean, I used to know a lot of academics I used to hate first year people. They, they, they thought that their essays were banal. They thought that they didn't know anything. And, and I, I, I used to get the job of teaching uh, first years quite often because I didn't have that attitude because they're, 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 they're learning. They're on the first thing. And so if somebody comes up and says, where do you get your protein? Now, obviously, some people say it's because they're trying to be smart, but some people might actually just genuinely kind of be curious about that. Well, it looks like we have several calls to keep going for a little bit. So maybe oh, if, really? if, if, if we... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, need, I need I need I need a pee. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, found, um, I found the Tom Reagan quote that um, that you referenced earlier, Roger, and I'll just read it here real quick. If everybody yeah, go wants. for it. It's really lovely, lovely, um, profound. The other emotional, uh, yeah, and logical. The other You're never going to get to read it now. <laughs> <laughs> Roger does this to me all the time. Now you know what I have to go through. <laughs> yeah, Reagan ticks all the, all the boxes. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> the other animals humans eat, use in science, hunt, trap, and exploit in a variety of ways have a life of their own that is of importance to them apart from their utility to us. They are not only in the world, they are aware of it, which what happens to them matters to them. Each has a life that fares better or worse for the one whose life it is. Mm. And uh, people um, <clears throat> think about that word utility as well, because um, built into Reagan's thing, especially that one, because that's from the 1989, uh, the, the uh, British Foundation thing, uh, was it? In, British Institute, um, there's a big attack there on uh, utilitarianism in that talk. Mm -hmm. And that and that means that Reagan is, is attacking the movement that we're in, main philosophy, something to think about, really, really kind of mm -hmm. profound thing in that sense. Yeah, and for those interested in exploring Reagan, I know I just added a whole new section to my website, actually the same page where the language document is that's linked in the main caption of this post. And there's the book, Empty Cages. <laughs> But yeah, there you'll find actually the speech we're talking about. It's a short clip, around eight minutes long. Um, and yeah, you can, Reagan is, Reagan's work is, I think for any um, animal rights advocate who wants to really understand the philosophy needs to spend some time with Reagan. Mm -hmm. mm, if only you could do it in person again. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's that, there's that. And that's, yeah, trying to keep that memory alive. And I think mm -hmm. on that summer note, I think, I'd like to finish on a bit of a, or move towards a bit of a, um, a fun one for me, which is um, the process of reclaiming 
some of these um, derogatory ways in which other animals are used. For instance, um, you know, all the slurs, I think we are all quite familiar with saying someone's as uh, fat as a cow, for instance, and actually re replacing that with as gentle as a cow. Or, you know, um, I, I've got a whole list here I can go through, but, you know, you know, instead of smelly as a pig, as smart as a pig, and really trying to highlight their strengths versus their weaknesses. So instead of swerving it all together, um, I don't know if that's something either the two of you have started using in your day-to-day -day language. It's Run fun, yeah. Well, and just taking back phrases like kill two birds with one stone, feed two birds with one scone. Fun. fun mm. <laughs> I, yeah, I, like think, I think I um, think Colleen patrick Gaudreau, I think, has written a book uh, about all these different different ones. I mean, personally, I just think it's horses for courses. <laughs> <laughs> he, can't, he can't stop himself, can he? <laughs> we need a buzzer every time he does one of those. <laughs> Another one I like because uh, I know a lot of t turkey friends um, at at the animal sanctuary friend, and they're quite cuddly. So instead, if someone says like as silly as a turkey, saying as cuddly a tur as a turkey, mm -hmm. and particularly from an activism or advocate perspective, um, you know, if someone says not my first rodeo we could say not my first rodeo protest you know in, in some of these things to really break so you're still basically latching on to the phrase that people already are already familiar with but then you can add that on and people can say wait a second did they just say protest why did they say that and start to dismantle why you know we're opposed to the idea of rodeos well, well just to bring a couple of strands together there um on on turkeys um eden has um a film that was made several years ago um, there's a quote from me in it, so that's how good it is. Um, the, uh, it's called, You've Never Lived Until You Hugged a Turkey. Uh, but it starts with, when the film opens, then it, there's a, a, um, an indent, you know, a kind of like a, a little box, where Reagan, Reagan comes on and, and, and says exactly what uh, Alison just said as well. It's called, mm -hmm. you ne You've Never Lived Until You Hugged a Turkey. That's, that's the film title. It's on YouTube. And there's a, like a short version and there's a 20 minute long version. That touches on something that's near and dear to my heart is this, because I make a lot of animal videos for social media. That's the focus of my work and, you know, you know my advocacy and campaigning. Um, it, and the thing that bothers me is that the videos I have where there's a human in the video do so much better than the animals by themselves. And it just, I, I just can't help but find a, I, I can't find a way around that. And I feel like I need to cater that to a little bit in order to get the message out. But I do feel like I'm still centering um, humans in that. And hopefully if there's animals, other animals involved too, you know, it's not completely decentering them. But there, I think there is this, this nature to be drawn towards um, things that are familiar to us. You know, if we just see a cow in the field, that's gonna be less engaging than all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know a mutual friend of ours for, for Al and I is a, a cow named Rosie, you know, her laying her head in my lap. That's a powerful moment. And I think people really resonate with that. However, she has value if she's just laying her head on the ground. It's just you. You made her do that for publicity reasons, didn't you? <laughs> that that is a really good point around um, just really you know sanctuaries in general, but especially from a, um, you know when we're trying to make content, is to really let the animals try to offer some form of consent, which I appreciate is a, a challenging mm. concept to really wrap our arms around. Mm. But really trying to let I really try to let them come to me and not even walk up to them and really just kneel down and let them approach me. And if they, you know, more often than not, they just keep on walking. I'm like, all right, cool. I won't say hi today, you know, and let them do you, decide. Do you, do you remember, do you remember, I don't know whether either of you remember this and it'd be interesting to see. I mean, we've really lit a spark here. There's loads of stuff on the, on the chat. We definitely got to come back to this. What we need to do is put together, um, you know, a, a list of all the things that we didn't get around to and, and, and go through those things. Like for example, um, there was a couple of issues that uh, I, I wrote down. Um, Jennifer talked about there was um, an Irish program, uh, a farming program, and they wouldn't talk about killing calves. They talked about putting them to sleep. And Declan, Declan brought up the, the issue that people say as a general massacre, oh, I feel gutted. Whereas obviously the etymology of that word is probably from the idea of gutting fishes or um, you know other animals in slaughterhouses, that kind of stuff. And also the point that I made to Jeremy before we came on air, was that the, the word in vivisection for killing is the word sacrifice. We, we sacrifice them, you know? Th there's all those, so there's lots of other things. But um, what, what, um, I think I've lost my thread. What was I, what was I about to say about- um, Back 
to these things that we haven't talked about in the good chat happening. The comments. Yeah, I think absolutely. I do go through these comments in detail. It's, uh, I don't get to all of them during the live chat, but I do go through all of them after the fact. So if we do miss anything, I'll do um, my best so that we can talk about that the next time and, and keep those conversations going because I think this is such an engaging way to do it. Um, I, there's a, I've got a couple of favorites on my list I have to share. And that's um, this is from a, a friend of mine, but um, instead of opening a can of worms, we can liberate a can of worms. <laughs> and also, um, and one thing we haven't really talked about, um, at, at least as directly, Roger touched on, you know, if our language harms others, we should take that seriously. And that's from a, a perspective of um, consistent anti-oppression. And an example of that is instead of um, turn a blind eye, saying pretend not to see, because turning a blind eye could have ableist implications mm -hmm. that we might not be aware of. And, and really, I appreciate this can get quite complex, but um, I think ableism is perhaps one of the least understood things just in general when we start to talk about isms. I mean, um, I think that the easiest example is the word crazy. I mean, how often do we see that word chucked around? And is that really taking uh, all, people, all with, the time. All with the time. people with mental illness? Is that really, um, or mental disability, is that really taking their perspective into account. You know, if we're going to um, campaign for the respect, focusing on other animals, shouldn't we be respectful of all animals? Uh, there's all kinds of things to be said about that. I mean, I was part of a, um, a Facebook conversation where an autistic person was begging uh, a professional in the movement not to use certain words. And the person just refused and said, you know, these are the words I want to use and I don't really care if it hurts you, you know, so, um, you know, we, we've got to be better than that. We could be, we could be better than that. We need to um, listen to each other. Sorry, what's that? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep up with Roger. <laughs> I think she set me up for that one. She was waiting for someone to find that. <laughs> point I actually wanted to make, but there were two, two, two purposes. <laughs> uh, well, one thing I've learned from this conversation Jeremy, is that I can call you Jay now from now on, Kai. Uh, yeah. All right, well, as long as I can call you R. <laughs> Are I'm you not... sure you want to do that, R? No, any, any, <laughs> swear, any swear word will do. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're used to answering to those. <laughs> well, I think with that, I think it is probably good to round this to a close, unless there's any other thoughts, either the, either the two you want to share around your thoughts around language in general. I, I never have any thoughts, so... <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, you've contributed quite a bit, R, for not giving a shit about this topic. So I can't wait to see you, when you do give a shit, what you'll... I think she, I think I, she just I, pulled I ahead think, of you in the I shit think, department. Yeah, I think you're right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> yeah, no, this is such an important and interesting conversation, and I've learned so much. Thanks for adding me in, and um, I'm happy to talk about my chickens anytime. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have to have you on as more of a regular guest. And and yeah. really, for anybody watching, if you have a camera and a I'll, microphone. Alice the chicken correspondent. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. I like that. <laughs> the chicken facts. Yeah. <laughs> what, and anyone's welcome to join us um, by video chat as well. I think the more people we involve, the better to get these um, conversations flowing. And if you are interested in this topic, a phenomenal Facebook group I can't recommend highly enough is Unlearning Speciesist Language. Um, so I highly encourage uh, anyone who's um, enjoyed this conversation to check out that Facebook group because that group's getting more inactive by the day and there's all kinds of questions like the ones we've been discussing today. Um, and it's a great way to keep these conversations um, going. Mm -hmm. um, and before we go, can I just say a thank you to Carl, uh, who's been our um, comment uh, moderator today, which um, from my point of view has really helped because I normally can't really see the comments very well on, on my particular setup. I don't, I don't have NASA, NASA control <laughs> like, uh, like Jay, like Jay does. Very so, uh, so th very th thanks for that, Carl. It's been really, really useful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Awesome. Oh, awesome. And th thank you everyone for joining us. We do try to do these live videos every week, especially during the current situation we are, we're in, if nothing else, just to bring us together. But I think of all this stuff, don't let this language stuff in intimidate you. And really the important thing is that we're getting out there and we're advocating in solidarity um, with our fellow animals. So don't let the fear of saying the wrong thing keep you from doing that. So thanks a lot. And thank you to our special first guest of the Animal Rights Show, Allison.
I can go back to my clapping now, can I? <laughs> <laughs> Clap us out. <laughs> See you next uh, week, everybody. Give me that ding, give me that, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> the singing started. It's time to end the broadcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cut, cut, cut. <laughs> See you next time. Take care. <laughs>